Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and usually we have a quorum at 9.33, so there's no, uh, no delay. We should get started. And I'll need, uh, yeah, Councillor Azey sitting down, so I think we're one, two, three, four, five, six, so we're good. Uh, so I will uh, call this meeting to or order. We have quorum. The 12th meeting of the Executive Committee uh, is called to order. Uh, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse nat First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And we also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, a reminder that people can watch us on YouTube at Toronto City Council Live uh, or follow the meeting on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at www.toronto.ca slash council. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? And if so, please indicate the item number and the nature of the interest. Seeing none, we can move forward. Uh, may I first have a motion to confirm the minutes of the Executive Committee meeting held on December the 11th, 2019? So moved by Councillor Ainsley. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Uh, we have 11 items on the agenda. Before we begin uh, the rundown, I would like to propose that we consider item 2.4, acquisitions and expropriation of airspace related to Rail Deck Park as the first item. Uh, I think there's a whole class of students who are here and uh, we want them to get back to doing their schoolwork as soon as possible. Delighted as we are that they're here at City Hall and so it's out of deference uh, to that group that we should uh, deal with that item uh, first. Uh, and I, am I right, uh, Councillor Pasternak, in that I might also be getting a motion from you to defer an item on the agenda? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. As we deal with the uh, rundown, I will, uh, uh, we'll get to that then. That's fine. Uh, now, we have a fairly, as you can see from the room, we have a fairly large number of people registered to speak today, and we adopt a principle here at the City Hall that is different than at other parliamentary and legislative forums, which is that everybody gets a chance to speak, but from time to time, uh, when the list is long, we will shorten up the time. And we, we by the way, uh, in order to be fair to everybody, we shorten up the time for the politicians as well to ask questions and to make speeches. And so um, I'm going to put a motion in front of the committee and ask for their concurrence uh, in uh, in, in uh, moving as follows. One, speakers who have not pre-registered be allowed to register to speak until 10 o'clock a.m. on January 23rd, 2020, after which no further registration will be allowed and the speaker's list will be closed. Two, uh, that the length of public presentations be limited to three minutes. Three, that questions of speakers by members of council, including members of the executive committee, be limited to three minutes with one round of questions per member. Four, that questions to staff from members of council, including members of the executive committee, be limited to three minutes in total with one round of questions per member. And five, that speaking times for all members of council be three minutes with one round of speaking uh, per member. And I'll just, so I'll, so I'll, I'll uh, ask for a concurrence on that motion. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And, and I will just say to the members of the public, first of all, you heard that the list will be closed at 10 o'clock, so if you're not on the list, please take steps to get on it. Uh, and secondly, just to ask for your concurrence, I know there are people here to say they're supporting some things we're doing. We're always happy with that because it uh, indicates public confidence as we proceed. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, please try and keep your comments brief and make changes if you have to. If you've got a five-minute uh, set of notes prepared, make some changes while you're waiting your turn. I will also call up the speakers in groups of three, not call them up, but I'll indicate what the next three are so that people can be ready to approach the uh, table uh, when it's their turn. So. Uh, on that basis, let's proceed with the rundown. Uh, obviously, members will know that if they want to hold an item, please state uh, your name and, and hold it. Uh, and for items with registered speakers, uh, I will hold uh, those, uh, those items. Uh, so, item one, at, at EX 12.1, the ravine strategy implementation is being held for speakers and a short presentation. Item 12, EX 12.2, digital infrastructure plan update. It is being held for deputations. Item 12.3, Ontario Transit, Toronto Ontario Transit Partnership Status Update is being held for deputations. Item EX 12.4, Acquisition and Expropriation of Airspace Related to Rail Deck Park is being held for deputations. Item EX 12.5, Advancing a New Culture of Innovation and Partnership is being held for deputations. Item EX 12.6, St. Lawrence Centre Redevelopment is being held for uh, deputations. Item EX 12.7, uh, police uh, Service 2018 Annual Statistical Report is being held for deputations. Item EX 12.8, uh, 
is uh, where we're going to have a motion from Councillor Pasternak. Uh, thank believe. you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this was uh, co-sponsored by Councillor Cole, who's out of town. He's asked me to defer it. Plus, I think we should uh, give a little more further thought to the response we've gotten from police services. So All I'd right, like so to defer Count it. Councillor Pasternak has moved a deferral of, uh, of item EX 12.8. Uh, may I call the question on that? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And, and I'll apologize to Miguel uh, 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 Avil Delarde De 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 that uh, you're here, but you're here for another item. So that one won't be heard today, but thank goodness you're here for another reason. You didn't come all the way for that one. So thank you uh, for your understanding. Item EX 12.9, authority to enter into a service agreement with the Canadian Red Cross for emergency social services. Um, is someone prepared to move the staff uh, recommendation? Moved by Councillor Ainsley. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Uh, item EX 12.10, Waterfront Toronto consent to borrow and encumber assets extension request. Uh, and uh, again, uh, may I have a motion to uh, to uh, adopt the staff recommendations? Moved by Councillor Pasternak. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Uh, item EX 12.11, review of new pregnancy uh, and parental leave policy for members of council. This is a report request uh, of the city clerk uh, on a number of different matters that are outlined in a, in a letter from uh, Councillor Cressy. Uh, th that's the rec recommendation here. Moved by Councillor Pasternak. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Okay. Uh, so I think then, uh, did I get your concurrence? I've forgotten now about reordering. I think I mentioned it but didn't ask for your concurrence to hear uh, the Rail Deck Park item first out of deference to the uh, to the scholastic diligence of our students that are here. Uh, may I have your agreement to confirm the agenda? We'll start with item 12.4, uh, uh, the acquisitions and expropriation of air airspace related to Rail Deck Park. Uh, and we'll adjust the agenda accordingly. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Okay. Uh, then. Twelve point four has uh, has three uh, deputants now. Should I also reorder the? Is it the Ord Street School that has the group here? Yeah. If if it's at the will of committee on a point of order, yes. uh, Mr. Mayor, we have I think there are 20 students here, yes. uh, grades uh, three and four students. If it's possible for them to go first so that they can get yes. back to class, that's as what I was asking. That's the Ord Street School, the yes. third deputy. Okay, that's well correct. we'll hear the third deputy first. They should take note of the fact of what special treatment they're getting today, but it's all in the interest of, scho <laughs> of scho scholastic achievement. Uh, so if we could ask Michael Walkington and the Ord Street School uh, group to come forward in whatever manner they uh, see fit and uh, give us their give us their presentation. Good morning. Thank you for coming this morning, and uh, over to you for your uh, for your presentation. I think you have to turn them on there. I think red button, turn on. Okay, there you go, guys. Go ahead, Motez. Hi, my name nice is loud. Motez. Your name's Motez. My name is Joshua, and my name is Aaron. And we're um, presenting how Rail Deck Park can help the city at Drew Day's Way. So we build um, a park that can help that can help animals and um, people. Um, it can reduce air pollution, um, like from factories, and it can also give people something nice to look at. It, it can also help some animals if they are found sick or hurt from this animal sanctuary. And uh, we could also set up a petting zoo there for the kids in the environment. And it could also um, create a unique attraction towards the park. Um, the money that we will get from the petting zoo can help fund for the animal sanctuary and the park. Thank you for listening. We built this park for people to enjoy beautiful stuff and 
and beautiful moments. Is that it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the um, circle in the middle of the park in the summer, it's a duck pond because it's a little duck. But in the winter, it's a skating rink. Anything else, guys? And the house on the top left is for um, um, indoor playgrounds when it's too cold in the park and a, uh, a, and a cafe. Anything else? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Leander. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. You saved us a lot of money, too, because we, we had to hire a lot of people to do that work for us. So. <laughs> it's really great. High five, Aaron. Tell your parents that their taxes won't go up as much here. Okay. All right, have we got this, is this, is this a solo appearance here, a yes. group of yes. one? Please, your turn, go ahead. Hi, my name is Leander, and I am almost nine, and I'm in grade three. I am going to be talking about how Rail Deck Park is important. First reason why is because Kids need to exercise, and they also need to get some energy out of their system so they don't hurt anybody like their parents or their siblings. <laughs> <coughs> Two, trees have oxygen, and we need to breathe oxygen. We breathe carb out carbon dioxide, and they breathe, trees breathe in carbon dioxide. Also, with trees, we would have an environmentally friendly city. The third reason is Rail Deck Park would be a great place for family reunions and other gatherings. It would be better in Toronto to have a free place to have gatherings. Fourth reason. If someone is tired or needs to relax, it would be best to have a peaceful bench to sit on and enjoy nature. Thank you for listening to my four reasons for building Real Deck Park. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much. That was very excellent. Yeah. We don't. We don't, Bonnie. We don't normally have applause, but we'll make an exception for. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, that's special. Rachel, uh, Ruby, okay. Annie, good. Yeah. Rio, Bonnie, Ruby, I, I, Annie, you guys will be okay to introduce yourself? Who are you missing? Where's I? Okay. Okay, good, all right. You can come and sh share the mic right here. Okay, introduce yourselves quickly. Hi, my name is Ruby. Hi, my name's Diane. Hi, my name is Rio. Hi, my name is Bonnie. And we're going to present to you why Rail Deck Park is important. Rail Deck Park is important because there are trees for birds to make nests. Rail Deck Park is important because kids can have fun and also there is lots of nature. Real fact. Fun fact. Uh, when it rains, the plants in the park grows. Um... People can take transit to Rail Deck Park from all over, like my friend Katerina, who lives in Mississauga. She can take the GO train there right away, and we might have a play date. It's like a big backyard for everyone. In Rail Deck Park, you can see animals and insects, such as birds, bees, ladybugs, and butterflies. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our presentation. presentation. Good job, girls. We have one last word. Thank you very much. Very good. Our last group, Rachel, Caitlin, Gemma. Rachel, Caitlin, Gemma. Rachel, do you want to start? Introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Rachel. Hi, my name is Kaylin. 
Hi, my name is Gemma. And we're here to show you what the real duck park should look like. Um, a fun fact for the Real Duck Park is that there can, there can be 500 people going there. As you can see, there is a sign with a car and a bike. That is where you can, put, you can park the cars and put your bikes. Rail Deck Park. Um, and to add, like, the, um, like, um, having this, um, uh, it's, um, it would be, it would, um, uh, there's, there's enough space and, like, the, 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 the um, slides and, um, uh, uh, objects in this, uh, Fun, yeah, it would be fun activities for the kids. Any, anything else, Gemma? Is that good? Okay, thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. That's it. Thank you very much. May I just say, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Walkington, who's the principal, thank you for engaging the students in a, a, a project that's of importance to the city, which we're going to discuss today. I think, thank you for uh, the opportunity. I think we all know that behind every successful person, there's at least one teacher or principal that made a big difference, if not more, and uh, I think you're doing a great job there, so thank you. Uh, to, to the young people, may I say that as much as I wish as mayor that I could give you the rest of the day off and issue some kind of declaration, not only will I not do that, but I will indicate that Mr. Walkington should take you immediately back to school to resume your studies. <laughs> and express uh, the strongly held view that I have, and probably my colleagues as well, that given that you're all eight and nine years old and from grades two, three, and four at Ord Street Public School, that none of you will be old enough to compete with us uh, for public office for, for another 10 years, which in my case should just about do, uh, do it, uh, and uh, others, I'm sure. But thank you, kids, very much for your interest and for that really good presentation. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, we have, yeah, we have some pins here uh, as well. Mr. Walker, maybe I'll just give you these, and you can give these to the kids as a souvenir of their visit. Well, hard an act as that is going to be to follow, nonetheless, it falls to me to uh, ask Ira Kagan uh, from Kagan Shastri on behalf of Kraft Kingsman Rail Corporation uh, to come forward and make uh, a deputation. Yes, that was a very hard act to follow. Um, good morning, uh, Your Worship, Mayor Tory, and members of the Executive Committee. Uh, as you know, my name is Ira Kagan. I'm the lawyer for the owners of the air rights between Blue Jays Way and Bathurst Street. I've got copies of a letter that I'm going to leave here for distribution uh, after I finish speaking. I've been asked by my client to make this deputation for two reasons. First, to correct some misleading errors in the record so that you and the public have the true facts. And second, to suggest that as changes to the staff recommendations so that council can exercise effective oversight over the next step in the rail deck park. And many of you know that my client has been on record consistently that the city should move quickly to purchase or expropriate the air rights, all of the air rights, not just three acres, if the city is really going to build its 20-acre park. My client wants fair market value for its land. That's what anybody would want. If the parties cannot agree on what fair market value is, the city can expropriate and the law will require the city to pay fair market value, not a dollar more, not a dollar less. If the city does not do this, they don't buy it, they don't expropriate it, then my client is entitled, as is any other private property owner, to develop its property in accordance with provincial policy. And as you know, the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal has scheduled just such a hearing, commencing November 22nd of this year, for my client's development application. Now, on January 16th, 2020, uh, Joshua Freeman of CP24 reported the following comment from the mayor. And I'm just going to quote, what's the old expression? People's eyes are bigger than their stomachs or expectations exceed reality. So when negotiations don't work, it's usually because there's a failure to agree on how much should be paid. This suggests that my client has refused an offer to purchase from the city because the price was too low. That's not true. 
No formal offer has ever been made. None has ever been rejected. My client is asking for fair market value. That can't be greedy. The same article goes on further to quote the, the mayor is saying, we're not going to have these people keep us at the table forever when this is a very important public initiative that we're taking in the interest of the city as a whole and the downtown neighborhood in particular. This suggests to me that my client is the reason for the delays. That's not true. And it's entirely unfair to my client. Despite the mayor's public announcement more than three years ago, August 2016, that the city uh, is going to proceed with Rail Deck Park, they have yet to present my client with a formal offer to purchase. The city's purchaser drives that process. Any delay is the city's delay. My client has attended every meeting which city staff requested. City staff asks for information, my client provides it. My client has not kept the city at the table forever, and it would be wrong for anyone to be under the impression that they were. I also note that at the LPAT hearing back in May of this year, city lawyer Mr. O'Callaghan advised the LPAT that, at that time, staff have the jurisdiction to value the land and make an offer, but that the process, the process of making an offer, had not even really started yet. That was just back in May of 2019. Now, in terms of the staff recommendations, it only deals with a small portion of the rights being three acres east of Spadina. The city announced a 20-acre park, not a three-acre park. Expropriation law requires that the city pay fair market value for any air rights being taken. That's what anyone would expect if their land is being taken from the government. So it really makes no difference whether you proceed with three or 20 or 16 or whatever number you think is appropriate, you're going to pay fair market value. City staff say in the staff report they can't proceed with the rest of the air rights until they know what the fair market value is. They don't need to know. The law of expropriation will determine it for everybody. Also, there's no timeline put on the staff recommendations to get these things settled, even for the three acres that you're being asked to deal with today. In my respectful submission, council should wrap direct up. staff. Uh, I have to ask you to wrap up. We're just at the three minutes. I'm on the last point. Perfect. I'll be very quick. Council should exercise effective oversight over staff, take control of this, and direct staff that they should either have a signed agreement of purchase and sale or expropriations commenced within 90 days. Given that more than three years have passed, 90 days seems more than fair. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're now going to have uh, some questions for you, and I'll, I'll start, if I may. Uh, for One thing we're not going to do here, I happen to think the mayor in making the comments that he made was right, but having said all that, that's fine. There's difference of opinion. But you, you have acknowledged there were meetings that did take place between the city and your client, correct? Of course. And would you also acknowledge that there were discussions of valuation, uh, quite explicit discussions of valuation, and we're not going to start negotiating numbers here in the front of the executive committee, but you will acknowledge there were discussions of valuation at those meetings? Like you, sir, I'm not going to negotiate in public. What I would like to say, though, again is no offer has ever been made. And as anyone who's tried to buy or sell a house knows, someone comes in and say, hey, I'd like to buy it from you. What do you think it's worth? That doesn't go anywhere. You start the, you start the negotiation part by presenting an offer, and staff have not done that. So just to ask that question one more time, because that wasn't my question, actually. My question was, were there discussions of valuation and the views of both parties of valuation, on valuation of those air rights at those meetings? Those discussions are without prejudice, and I'm not going to disclose okay. them. Okay. Well, I think everybody knows today. what the answer is. So um, then, uh, will you acknowledge uh, that uh, the report that's in front of the executive committee today is doing exactly what you suggest should be done, which is moving forward to say we're going to try one more time on the phase that we're going to proceed with first, uh, on the east side, as it were, uh, to negotiate, and then we will proceed. And it is actually taking the first steps, authorizing the taking of the first steps, subject to city council approving, to expropriate. Would you acknowledge that that is uh, exactly what this report recommends? Uh, no. Oh. What, I, what I would say is, is that the first step staff already, according to Mr. O'Callaghan's statement to the LPAD, staff already had authority to value the land and make an offer. So if that's part of what's being proposed today, they've had that authority since well before May. The other thing I was saying was it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't put any timeline on anything, so this could still continue ad infinitum, and it only deals with three of the 20 acres of the rail deck park. Just, so just to clarify again, you've I know you've read the report, Yes. and it says that they, we would serve some of the requisite notices to begin the expropriation process if negotiations fail, and that there will be a report back on that in the spring of this year. So I think there is a timeline by which they have to report back to City Council to get authority to proceed. So will you acknowledge that says that right in the report? 
I acknowledge it says that. I don't interpret it to mean that they have to expropriate okay. by the spring. Okay, and then finally, uh, you would agree with me, I'm sure, that it's our job to decide on how we phase this. If we want to proceed with some of the eastern uh, acquisition or expropriation first, that's our business. I mean, we, we are the ones doing the expropriating. We're the ones building the park. It's our business how we proceed with this, not yours. Not at the prejudice of a private property owner who has a development application scheduled for November. Well, look, I'll make, I shouldn't do this from the chair, but I'll make one comment, which is given a choice between building more condo towers, leaving the rail uh, gap the way it is now, or building a park there, I'm for the park. But thank you very much for coming, and we'll, there'll be other questions, I'm sure, for you. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you for being here. Just a point of clarification. So your request is for the city in good faith to work towards purchasing and if necessary through expropriation the air rights. Is that correct? All of the air rights. Okay. So just to clarify, the last time your client was represented here, they were they, they their request was to build buildings and they were unwilling at that time to entertain selling for a park. So is that that has now changed? It hasn't changed, that was never their position. Their position was that if you don't buy it, you have to let us build in accordance with provincial but, policy. But just to be clear, you just said to them, my, my first question was, are you here asking us to purchase, and if necessary, expropriate the entirety? And your answer was yes. The last time your client was represented here, they said they were uninterested in selling, but rather building. So that has changed, correct? No, no, that was not their position then, and you've misunderstood my position now. Okay, that's... What, what we've been saying from the beginning is, if you want to buy it or expropriate it, do so quickly. We can't stop you from expropriating. The law allows you to do so. But if you're not gonna move quickly, please let us proceed with the development. Okay, We're not begging you to buy it. If you wanna buy it, do it quickly. I, I'm pleased to hear that you're now entertaining selling the land on we behalf of your We have always client. been entertaining. Otherwise, thank we wouldn't have the meetings. Thank you very much. I really appreciate yeah, Just very b briefly, Mr. Mayor. So, um, so on page six of the report, it, it, it clearly says the negotiations have been going on for about two years and they've not uh, been successful in, in an agreement. And I assume the one thing we can agree on here is that there's no agreement. Because there's been no offer. But there's, there's, no, there's been negotiations and there's been no agreement. So I assume your client could have uh, put some kind of number on the table. I wasn't privy to these meetings. But how long, how long do you think the city should go on and on and on uh, in these negotiations before before we can exercise our rights under the law? Consistent with Give it the another, what would you say, five years, 10 years? God, no. Consistent with the submissions I made at the LPAT hearing back in May, the city should have decided by now to make an offer, a formal offer, or to commence expropriation proceedings. It's already taken too long. I think the 90 days that I'm asking you to impose on staff is more than reasonable. Well, I think this report concurs that it's taken on too long, and I think the position of the city is it's taking the public good over private profit, profits. Would you agree with that's the approach that's before us now? The city, of course, is entitled to make that, is to take that position, and we're not saying you shouldn't expropriate, and we're not saying you shouldn't buy. We're saying it's taking too long at the expense of our development application. Please get on with deciding one way or the other. Well, I think we'll be deciding today. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. You, you mentioned your development application. So what is, you have a development application in at the city. What, what is the status of that? Uh, council refused You have it. a development application? Yes, council refused the development application right around the same time as it approved Rail Deck Park. And then we appealed that refusal to the LPAT. Right. And we have a hearing scheduled for November of this year. Okay, so you don't know until November what the decision uh, would be on your application that you appealed. That's right. In fact, we'll have to wait for a decision which could take some time. It'll be after November. Any other questions of the deputy? Okay, thanks, Mr. K. Appreciate Thank you very much. Being here today. Uh, who, who, who do I leave uh, these copies with? Sorry, I Yeah, you, thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Hamish Wilson is the final deputy on this matter. Mr. Wilson, good morning. 
Yes, good morning. And you have uh, three minutes, and we welcome you. Well, lucky me. Uh, thanks for hauling in. Uh, I'm a bit uh, conflicted about this because, of course, we need the park. Uh, it's overdue. I superimposed uh, an old map of Toronto that I found with a new uh, map lining up the, uh, uh, the, the infill. And that yellow line there is where the shoreline was, approximately. And above that, you can see reserved for a public pleasure ground. Uh, way back when, uh, we were supposed to get a park south of Front Street. It obviously didn't happen. There's been a huge amount of infill, uh, and it, I don't know who sold the land. Uh, we've certainly profited by it. Uh, and we do need the open space. Uh, and the parkland. So yes, absolutely, there should be a lot of money around from all the taxes, from the sale of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the water lots uh, to allow for a good uh, park going in. But the conflict is we also desperately need better transit. And there's a slim chance still that we could actually have a better uh, 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 mini relief line, I think. Uh, we don't do transit well, particularly particularly well in this city, especially in logical corridors, it seems. Uh, we've had lots of old plans for east-west uh, transit. Uh, there's the pinch point at High Park uh, into the core. That's such a logical corridor. Um, I've been thinking uh, recently in the last few years, how about a compromise, because again, we can't necessarily do things properly, of having a reversible transit way on the north side of the rail tracks from, uh, uh, from Queen and Dufferin there, pardon me, uh, down to front and then in along front. Now, when you get into the core, there's such competition for land. We need every single little bit of uh, width that we can get. So on that one uh, remnant strip of uh, the, uh, the Lands and Gardens Trust uh, from Bathurst over to Spadina, that could be a, an, an easy entry point and exit point uh, from any transit way uh, into the core. And we'd have to put to restore transit to Front Street on surface. So yes, go ahead and, and do things, but please, please, please keep the options open for transit. Don't build them shut because that's how we tend to do things here in the city. And again, it's a new idea. We haven't done reversible transit ways. Uh, and what the, the, the problem of having the, the vehicles return to the, uh, the, the end of uh, uh, the, the line there, you can send them back on Queen and King. And after the, uh, the incident yesterday uh, with the, the transit uh, foul up up on Bloor, we need backup. So we've got to start thinking thinking about all the options. And this is from uh, the 1992 uh, West Waterfront LRTEA, and they were modeling just how much time savings there'd be with a direct route in. We need better transit in the core. Relief West, please. Thanks, Mr. Wilson. Any questions of uh, the deputant? Okay. Uh, seeing none, I'll thank you very much for being here. That's the end of the uh, deputations, and uh, so that would move us to questions of staff. And uh, we would go first to people outside of the uh, committee. Uh, uh, Councillor Cressy, no questions. I, I might just ask just a couple of very brief questions, if I could, uh, of the Create TO people if they're here. Is there, are there people here from Create TO? Uh, oh, we're, we're, I don't see him. Oh, over the, sorry about that. Didn't see you there. Uh, could I just ask you, uh, just in this matter of uh, sort of discussions and if, when, and whether, and all that, have there been, uh, could you just confirm or not to the, to the committee and to the people here, uh, whether there have been discussions between the deputant we heard from earlier on uh, and uh, the city officials, create TO or otherwise, uh, on the subject of the acquisition of these air rights? Yes, through the chair. Um, there have been a number of meetings. I counted four when I was sort of toting it up. Um, in terms of the, 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 the nature of the negotiations, you, you try to start out with, with uh, a verbal conversation to understand each party's position. Um, as a result of those four meetings, we were un, unable to, the, I would describe the, the gap as unbridgeable, and so therefore a formal offer was not drawn up because it, it really would be just be a waste of paper and, and, and legal fees. And so it, the, the gap was just so wide that we just felt it wasn't worthwhile to, to go forward and the, the more effective strategy in terms of addressing the issue would be... I forgot to restart the clock. Uh, just to be clear on when you t talk about a gap, that was what I was asking Mr. Kagan about, which is there was discussion at these meetings and the gap is between the valuation initial estimates or whatever you want to call it of the two parties. Uh, that's the gap you're talking about. Yes, it was a very substantial gap. 
And my final question is simply this. Um, is, it, is it your understanding that no development can proceed in any event on the, any of the site we're talking about here uh, because of the very LPAT hearing that was referred to in November uh, and the time will, that will be taken to get a decision from that hearing? So there's no development application being held up uh, by any of this because it can't happen until after that LPAT hearing. Would that be a correct understanding? That's correct. Okay. That's, those are the questions I have. Anybody else? Uh, any questions of uh, staff at all? Okay. Uh, that would then move us to speakers. Uh, Councillor Cressy. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, let me begin, first of all, by uh, thanking you for your leadership and unwavering leadership on this file. Uh, and to our city staff, this is across departments, from Parks Forester and Recreation to Create TO to City Planning, a interdivisional team effort, and I want to commend them. You know, there's an old saying that you have to imagine the city you want before you can build it. And I think the students we just heard from, from uh, Ord Street Public School, seven and eight year olds talking about the city they want to live in. You have to imagine the city you want 100 years from now, and then you have to go out and build it. And Rail Deck Park is truly a once in a generation city building opportunity to transform all of Toronto. Now, City Council has already committed to continuing work to advance Rail Deck Park. With the report in front of us, we can now make it a reality. Uh, today's report takes the critical step in securing the first phase of Rail Deck Park. Staff are recommending that we continue to negotiate for the purchase of the air rights, but also, if necessary, to initiate expropriation. And combined with a private parkland proposal, which is immediately next door, what's in front of us here would actually expand Rail Deck Park. Simply put, the report in front of us means more parkland faster and cheaper. That's what this is, more park faster and cheaper. Uh, public spaces, we all know this as councillors, make cities livable. In downtown Toronto, they're not only critical, they're desperately needed. In the next 25 years, the population of downtown is expected to double to 500,000 people, and the number of daily employees is also expected to double to 900,000 people. And so that's in addition to the millions of annual visitors who go down to the Sky Dome and the aquarium and others. And so this is an opportunity for residents, for workers, for visitors, and from people across the country to visit Rail Deck Park. Uh, you'll look to other cities. Chicago, when they built Millennium Park, it quickly became one of the top three destinations in the United States. This can be and will be a citywide destination. Uh, I truly believe that great cities invest in their future. Is Rail Deck Park, the mayor's proposal, bold? You bet. Is it ambitious? It absolutely is. But it is exactly the type of necessary 21st century city building that I think we're ready for. And with this proposed next step, we can take a giant leap to actually getting out and getting it built. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cressy, uh, are there uh, other uh, members visiting? I don't see any in the room from uh, the council that wish to speak. Members of the committee wishing to speak? Okay, well, I will just uh, say a few words if I might then. Uh, I will reset the clock properly here. Um, colleagues, I uh, will simply bring to your attention uh, the fact that I think we continue to have the same three choices we've always had with respect to this, uh, what I would describe as last chance uh, in the downtown for something big and bold and that is really going to address a severe deficiency that exists in the downtown where we not only today have hundreds of thousands of people working and living every day and the number increases by the day, but projections show even on the basis of approved developments already tens of thousands of more people. And this is the single most parkland deficient, based on a measurement, uh, area of the entire city. But beyond that, it's the last chance we have to create something that way beyond the needs uh, and the understandable needs. When people live in high-rise buildings, they don't have a backyard. They don't have some of the places to go and play that other people do in other forms of housing in other parts of the city. And so I think it's fair that we should provide for those. It's our job to provide for those people who are living there now and are going to live there. But beyond that, this is going to be something that is going to be an iconic attraction for people from around the city and the region and from around the world. Think about Chicago with and without Millennium Park. And I, I assure you, this is going to be something of that caliber that we're going to do there. It's in a different setting, but it's going to be something of that caliber that people from around the world, when they come to Toronto, are going to go and see it and experience it, winter or summer. And that is something we need more of in the city of Toronto, iconic places where people can go that are attractions for the whole region and for the whole, uh, of the whole world. And, and I, I, I will just say to you that you've heard from our city officials who have no axe to grind in this, 
we're just trying to do something to advance the public interest, that there have been meetings held, contrary to the impression that was left with you, that there were very explicit discussions, I assure you, about valuation, and to quote uh, our president of CreateTO, there was an unbridgeable gap. You know what that means. And I'll leave it for you to take whatever interpretation you want uh, from that expression, but I think it accurately describes what's uh, going on here. And this comes from our professional staff. Secondly, no development is being held up. You've heard again from the deputant himself that there's a hearing that's scheduled for November and then time for a decision after that. So at the moment, no development could proceed there. So nothing is being held up. What we're doing is moving ahead with the process of, of further negotiation if it bears any fruit and then to expropriation to get on with doing this park. Because if you take the presentation of the same three choices that have always, always existed for that part of the city, they're still there. And I think the city council has said, I have said as a member of that council and the leader of that council, that when given a choice between more condos on that last opportunity that we have to actually create some land there and do we create the land there and turn it over to more condos, or do we leave this, this scar on the city, which is a, u a, a useful and necessary scar, it's a rail corridor, do we leave it as a rail corridor that not only divides the city, but is no uh, great treasure to look at, or do we do the once in a lifetime thing that we have a chance to do here, which is to create a brilliant, iconic, globally recognized, citywide used uh, park uh, for the local people and for all the residents of the City of Toronto. And I will simply repeat what I said, I'm for the park. And that is why this recommendation starts to move that forward on the easternmost portion of the air rights and coincides with some other developments that are happening to create an initial seven acre phase of this park to be followed as soon as possible by getting on with the rest of it. So that's what this is all about. I'll be supporting it and I hope that my colleagues will too and the members of City Council when it comes there uh, in a week or so. So if there are no other uh, uh, comments, I'm ready to call the question on the, uh, did I have any kind of a motion I was supposed to move? No, it's on, I have something on ravines. So I will then call the question on the staff recommendations. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you very much and thanks to the deputies. Appreciate that. Okay. Now we can go back to the uh, agenda. And the item that is 12.1, EX 12.1 is the ravine uh, strategy implementation. And uh, what we've asked our staff to do, uh, led by Janie Romoff, who is coming up, uh, is uh, to give us a brief uh, presentation on exactly where this fits in uh, to uh, the process that's now well underway. And then we will go to a long list of deputations and then uh, to questions of staff and so on. So um, just a minute for the presentation to come up. So what are we, we're waiting for the presentation to get so fired up? We're waiting for the presentation. On the technology here? It's loaded and... Okay. Just give it another minute and then we should start. Yeah. Because we have in the material, of course, a lot of these maps and charts that are probably forming a part of your t uh, visual. Okay, we're gonna, oh. we're gonna start. All right. Um, I think the presentation has been distributed. Yes. Uh, so everybody has a paper copy of it. Uh, Being distributed are, right now. It's coming? Okay, so I'll just be, I'll just start. It's way better with the visuals, but I will uh, muster on through without uh, and begin the meeting with a land acknowledgement uh, before we go further. I want to point out that the indigenous uh, people that walked these lands before the arrival of European settlers and created trails and water routes through the ravine system that is important to our city today. And we have kept this in mind uh, uh, and, uh, and its important connection as we advance the, the ravine strategy. City Council adopted the Ravine Strategy in October 2017. Uh, both the Ravine Strategy and the Implementation Plan Report, which is what you see before you today, is an interdivisional uh, effort. And you will note that um, uh, both Parks, Forestry and Recreation, myself, Toronto Water, City Planning are actually signatories to the report. But I would like to acknowledge and point out that Transportation Services and a number of other city divisions were also involved and certainly are partners at the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority are, are a big partner in the strategy. 
Uh, the strategy uh, uh, supports uh, the vision of a ravine system that is natural, connected, sanctuary essential for the health and well-being of the city, where use and employment support protection, education, and stewardship. A few figures uh, just around Toronto's ravine system, which takes up 17% uh, of Tor Toronto's full land, 11,000 hectares, and most of the city's environmentally significant areas. Uh, there's a great slide on this, which you, you probably have in front of you, which looks at all of the partners and stakeholders that are involved in the ravine system and the ravine strategy implementation, including a number of not-for-profit groups, uh, indigenous communities, academic institutions, residents and landowners, and other levels of government. And certainly the strategy reflects their input and the coordination of, of those stakeholders together. Would also like to note that the strategy represents uh, an alignment of a number of different city strategies uh, in all the divisions across the city, including uh, many different strategic plans uh, involving Toronto Water, uh, Parks, Forestry and Recreation, city planning, and is encompassed by the city's event, uh, official plan. And the idea around the plan is a, is a foundational document to key all of those different strategies together as we move forward in the years to come. There are, um, uh, the implementation plan focuses on four main areas that are outlined in the report. The first is the identification of 10 priority investment areas, uh, launching of the first ever city uh, campaign, which will be the ravine campaign, advancing additional investment in invasive species management, which has been a, very, a topic of great interest to many, and initiating a new ravine litter cleanup service, which has also been uh, a, a big talk of talk of discussion uh, with many of our stakeholders. All of these support the five guiding principles of the strategy, protect, invest, connect, partner, and celebrate. Priority investment areas, which are all identified in the report, uh, should note that there are 105 ravine areas across the system. Uh, in the previous report to Council, uh, Council approved the criteria around how to identify these priority investment areas, and this report identifies all of those and also prioritizes the first 10 for investment. Uh, the investment is primarily focused on enhancing access, protecting and restoring the environment, and increasing resiliency. The plan recommends a $104.9 million investment over a 10-year period starting in 2021, which will be the subject of uh, an implementation in the 2021 capital budget. Uh, secondly, establishing a ravine campaign, which would be a multifaceted campaign uh, to rally support in the community, build energy, and generate additional funds from many, many partners. The simple goal is to accelerate the implementation of the ravine strategy beyond the city's investment and leverage the city's investments. Uh, through the campaign, we will be establishing a leadership table made up of Torontonians and philanthropists and serving as cheerleaders and as a sounding board for a number of projects. The first significant project in partnership with Evergreen, who I understand are here today, and the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, who are also here today, is the Loop Trail. And the Loop Trail is a continuous off-road, multi-use ring trail along the Humber and Don ravines, creating east-west connections across the Finch Corridor and the waterfront, knitting together five ravine priority investment areas and 22 neighborhood improvement areas. The project uh, will advance items in a number of, of city and partner strategies, including this ravine strategy, the city's cycling network plan, the TRCA regional trail strategy, and it will also connect and support the Meadowway, which connects the Highland and Rouge uh, ravine systems. Another exciting component of this uh, plan and the recommendations uh, is the Into the Ravines Nature at Your Doorstep program, a new grant and engagement program that will mobilize and reach communities and provide some report, uh, support for their efforts in the ravine, ravine system. This is a $200,000 program that will encompass a number of micro grants as well as some activation programs in the ravine with our partners park people who are here today. Immediate investments uh, that are outlined in the report beginning in 2021, uh, the report recommends uh, a, an additional $2.5 million in invasive species management. That is to uh, add to the existing $2.63 million uh, that is invested annually now. And a ravine litter pickup program. Uh, currently, uh, just under a million dollars is, is invested in that. We're recommending an additional investment of $657 million annually.
The total new and enhanced operating impacts when fully implemented uh, will be $2.7 million uh, uh, annually starting in 2021. The report also uh, recommends uh, ravine coordination and the establishment of a ravine coordination unit within Parks, Forestry and Recreation to look at three primary cross-divisional uh, and cross-stakeholder efforts in capital planning, ecosystem services and partnership outreach. Uh, that, Mr. Mayor and members of committee, is our presentation. Uh, and we have everyone from a number of city divisions here to take questions. Uh, Janie, uh, thank you, and to your team as well. I'm sure it'll be said many times today. Uh, you know, the, the uh, laboring aura has been carried by your staff, as always, here in make, getting us to the strategy in 2017, and now, very importantly, uh, two years later, to the implementation plan, which we're here discussing today. So thank you very much to your whole team. I think what we'll do is have you uh, step out uh, now, uh, away from the table. We'll proceed with the deputations, and then uh, we can come back, and after hearing all of that, including your presentation, we can have questions thank of staff you. at that time. I would like just to acknowledge Wendy Strickland, who's been our ravine uh, project manager over the last year and a half. Thank you. And that's thanks, of course, was to her as well. And uh, so thank you to the whole team and to Wendy and to yourself. Uh, so we now have, uh, where did we go? Sorry. There we are. <laughs> we now have a uh, list of deputations. And again, what I would do is to give you three at a time so people can just be ready to come up when it's their turn. Uh, and uh, we accept all positive and, and uh, const constructively critical comments, but I think if people can use an economy of, uh, of words here, we do have uh, 29 people to be heard uh, on, on this item alone. So we're just anxious to uh, get the input, and uh, uh, there will be questions if we uh, don't have enough time. So Harry Jongerden, Toronto Bot Botanical Garden, Jenny Davis, High Park Nature Centre, and Cynthia Chrysler are the first three. Uh, and so, Mr. Jongerden, welcome. Thank you for coming, and over to you. I'm the garden director at TBG. Uh, Toronto Botanical Garden thanks the city staff who prepared this excellent report and thanks you in advance for your vision and for your anticipated approval of the Ravine Strategy Implementation Report. As a nonprofit with a mission to connect people to plants, inspiring us to live in harmony with nature, we have been the city's partner since 1958. We are today, even more deeply, the city's partner as we undertake the implementation of a master plan and management plan that has been approved by Council. You have approved the creation of a world-class botanical garden by us, your nonprofit partner, and we are moving rapidly to deliver on our promise to you and to the people of Toronto. The approved plans give us management authority over a portion of the Wilkett Creek Ravine that runs through Edwards Gardens, while Edwards Gardens becomes part of a larger TBG. With the support of grant monies, we have hired professional staff to begin the planning for the restoration of a degraded ravine ecosystem within Edwards Gardens. In time, we will have the plan, the staff, and the volunteer support to carry out our ecological restoration program. Support from all levels of government will be key to unleashing our capacity to create this world-class botanical garden. As we read the Ravine Strategy Implementation Report, we go check, 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 check when we consider TBG's role as your partner. We bring expertise and resources in support of all five guiding principles of the ravine strategy. The implementation report calls for the city to partner in unleashing nonprofit and volunteer passion for ravine preservation and restoration. Besides TBG, there are stewardship groups around the city just waiting for a green light to restore nature. We can assist you in training them and providing them with resources as volunteer groups partner with each other within a ravine strategy framework. Thank you for the hope you have given us to create a greener, healthier world by approving the ravine strategy implementation plans. Two minutes and 30 seconds. Are there others to speak as part of the uh, 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 comments? No, you're a delegation of three, but he spoke uh, for the for all, so say you all. Please, if you've got a bit more time, so no. We're not part of him. We're separate. Oh, you're part, oh, you're so efficient that you've actually got right to the table. Oh, I see. This is beyond even my wildest expectation. Thank you for that, right. Mr. Jongerden. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions of the deputy? This deputy. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Uh, so, Jenny Davis, uh, please uh, proceed then with your uh, deputation. Thank you. 
Hello. I'm here because I love High Park and because I'd like to talk to you about the elephant in the park, which isn't actually an elephant, it's dogs. Lots of off-leash dogs. And you don't need to be a biologist to notice the effects the off-leash dogs have on the park. I would encourage you to take a walk down Spring Creek Road and actually look at the ravine slope. What you will see are roots that are exposed. You will see big roots and small roots with tiny hairs. You will see lots of trails that are created by the dogs that are running in the on-leash area next to their dog owners that are walking in the off-leash area. Now, these views are not mine alone. In the last TRCA report on the terrestrial biology inventory of High Park, it was published in 2019, they say, the main disturbances affecting High Park at present are intensive trampling from park visitors and off-leash dogs in the upland habitats. It goes on to say, the most affected areas in the mixed forest along Spring Creek the most effective areas are the forests along Spring Creek Road. Several rare and sensitive flora species have disappeared in recent decades from the area. Much of the soil in the northern half of Spring Creek Ravine is bare and eroding. Dog walking is a major contributing with off-leash dogs spreading from the official fenced area. It goes on to say, um, lastly, if dog activity was effectively restricted to Dog Hill, it is possible that some ground nesting breeding bird species may return to High Park. So I have a few solutions. Some of them might be radical, but I think it's a time to be radical. First one, actually create a no dog policy in High Park. There is precedent for this at Tommy Thompson Park, also known as Leslie Spit. I see some people shaking their head. Um, but the case made in 1985 when that policy was introduced was that there are many places for people to walk their dogs, but very few spaces for wildlife to live and for people to actually connect with those animals. Second solution is not so radical. It actually says that every dog in the park should be on leash. Can anyone here, I ch I, I'd like to ask the councillors a question, can anyone here name two parks in Canada that have the precedent for all dogs to be on leash? Anyone want to guess? Stanley Park, Mount Royal Park, these are urban parks in two of Canada's biggest cities. Stanley Park is actually 2.5 times bigger than High Park and it does not have one dog off leash area. Thirdly, the last solution I'd like to present to you is to limit all dog leash to Dog Hill. It's the only place in the park that has fences big enough and strong enough to actually keep most of the dogs in. All of these solutions would take enforcement and not bylaw enforcement because most people in High Park know that you don't have to give your ID to bylaw officers. The I'll other have to part. I'll ask you to wrap up because we're. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yes, and it's, I just wanted to say that the ravine strategy, actually one of the five guiding principles, actually asks that um, politicians make long-term decisions that transcend short-term interest. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Davis. Uh, questions of the deputy? Seeing none, I will thank you very much for your deputation. Uh, and we have Cynthia Chrysler. I have a presentation. Is it possible for me to... Yes, I'm sure there's somebody that can help you to hook that up and uh, get that done. Um, Maybe what we might do just while somebody come, comes out. Oh, look, here they come, and so we're, we should right on the dime here. And uh, just to remind people, the next uh, uh, two or three after Ms. Uh, Ms. Chrysler are Irene uh, Vandertop from Don't Mess with the Dawn, Linda Brett from Bloor Street East Neighborhood Association, and John Boston's from Midtown Ravines Group. Apparently, I can't hook up. My computer won't You're do not. it. So I'll just have to. I'm sorry about to that. It. Apologies. Uh, thank you very much. Thank um, you. So, first of all, I just wanted to say why I'm here. I'm a resident of the Deer Park area. I live quite near the uh, Vale of Avoca, which is one of the priority areas identified in the staff report, the Yellow Creek Moore Park zone. Um, and I walk frequently in the ravine. I also walk down at the brickworks. So I experience the invasive species that are growing. I see them every day. Um, 
And I'm very concerned that we're getting to the point where these natural spaces will not be salvageable because the growth is just, it, it's visible to me. And I'm not a master gardener. There are others around here that know much more that are scientists. I'm a resident that's learned relatively recently from the City of Toronto website, I might add, about invasive species. That was my starting point. And I realized there was a few in my backyard and I dealt with those. And I realized that there's tons just in the ravine right by my house and I'm not allowed to do anything about it. Um, I'm also the president of the Deer Park Residents Group that's, uh, and supportive of the Midtown Ravines Group. We're a member there, and so I very much support the submission that will follow later. Um, my first point is that the timing of funding, oh, well, my first point is to thank you very much for allocating the funding to the ravine implementation um, strategy. Uh, very supportive of that funding, and I know that it's hard when the city has so many competing interests. I would uh, say, though, that the timing of the funding for dealing with the invasive species is a concern. Most of it is phased in, whereas things like trails and um, those kind of things seem to come first. That's a concern because what we see is, you know, there's lots of pictures all over the place about how this, this grows. But my own little local example, in a park right beside the ravine, the David Balfour Park, which is now under construction for the reservoir. I watched a patch of Japanese knotweed, this big, big as a bread box, grow to a massive, like overarching sort of five, 10 refrigerators um, over one summer. I, I watched that grow. And for sure those roots are getting to the ravine. For sure those roots are adding to the Japanese knotweed problem in the ravine. And there's nothing that I could do about it and there was nothing being done about it. So it's a big concern when you see it very obviously in front of you. Um, the other thing, I would say that the timing is also a problem because the invasives need to come before the other things. Because if we don't deal with them soon, I can just see it becoming more and more costly, more difficult to deal with. So that's just, seems obvious to me. Finally, um, I wanted, as you can see, I'm really interested in helping and I would like to be able to be one of those volunteers that helps. I would advocate strongly, I know the staff report mentions stewardship and volunteer programs, also mentions that there is now a requirement for much more staff supervision to maintain the same level of volunteers. I don't know what the details are of that, but I would advocate strongly for much less red tape and burden around people who want to help because it's not that complicated. Thank you. I'm, I'm done. Um, just maybe if I could ask you a question, just because it addresses one of your points. Um, are you aware of the fact that I indicated, and because I indicated and I have a motion that will be moved a couple of them actually here at this yeah. meeting today to accelerate the funding to start in 2020 for the invasive species and the litter cleanup because uh, invasive species don't wait for us. So yes. uh, that yes. was something that's on the table here and I hope will be approved here and at council to get on with that funding this year. And I would be very much supportive of that, but I was assured that it was still good to... to yeah, no, no, it's fine. Support. I'm just saying I want to make sure you were aware that, that I had indicated that I thought this should happen, and I need the support of my colleagues to do that, and I'm sure we'll have it. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to ask that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions of the deputy? Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here. Much appreciated. Uh, so, uh, we had Irene Vandertop, Linda Brett, and John Bossens next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm uh, one, Irene Vandertop, one of the founders of Don't Mess With the Dawn, and we're here in support of the, uh, the Ravine Strategy Implementation Plan. Um, we formed Don, Don't Mess With the Dawn because we were very aware of uh, massive um, areas in the Don Valley that are just looking like complete landfill acres and acres of trash filled that nobody was doing anything about. So we organized uh, cleanups over the past two years. Last year we conducted the biggest cleanup and uh, ecolo uh, ecological volunteer-led intervention in Toronto, in the history of uh, Toronto, with a thousand volunteers. Um, we thought we were only going to get about 100 or 200 people and 9,000 uh, 9, people pledged to come. Luckily only a thousand came because it was a rainy day. But we hold um, 40,000 pounds of garbage to date. 
that um, cleared out completely 20 acres, 17 ravines, and the amount is just staggering. And what is beautiful is that you can see that the amount of volunteers that we were able to get for these efforts is just mind-blowing. Torontonians care about the ravines, and I think that this is just in support of the ravine uh, strategy, that this is something that is badly needed. Through these efforts, we've saved the city on a conservative effort uh, estimate, $120,000, with all the volunteers and all the hours that we put in, only in the last two years. But these efforts were not without, uh, um, without a battle. It was not easy to organize this cleanup. The city forced us to purchase a permit to clean this up, even though it was Clean Toronto Together Day. We had to pay $600 for a permit, $300 for insurance. We had to get our own porta potties at $300 per porta potty. We had to beg the city to open the gate to please let the volunteers in. And um, although there were individuals within the city who were extremely helpful, um, the organization uh, and the body as the city was just uh, a beast to deal with. It was very obstructionist. So. As the Ravine Implementation Plan talks about uh, engaging community advocacy groups in the ravines and volunteers, I would like the city to take a look at how they support these groups and how they're going to, um, uh, to make sure that they remove the obstacles for their efforts. Um, another thing that we as a group have been doing is looking at where does the waste come from? Because a lot of this litter is not just the accidental uh, picnic that has gone wild. A lot of this is preventable. It's coming from mostly um, big residential areas, high rises at the ravine edges. These, ed uh, these places have often not very well concealed dumpsters. There is no management or oversight of how the garbage is disposed of, and we see it. Currently, we're the only organization who is really looking at where the garbage comes from and what are the preventative measures we can take to prevent this from happening in the first place. Now, the city is, uh, is going to put, hopefully, um, money towards cleaning up the ravines, but where is the plan for preventing the garbage from flowing in? It's not rocket science. The, the security of the, the bins and the closeness near the edge of, a, uh, of the ravines is just put one and one, two to, uh, together, yeah. and um, you can find where the, where the problem Lies. Right. And, and I will have to ask you to conclude on that note, because uh, we're three minutes uh, yeah. half now, okay? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, are there questions of the deputy? Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm sorry. I'd like to put my, just nice. my key recommendations yeah. Yeah, Don't run away. Um, have you, um, regarding enforcement, I assume enforcement of our, our littering bylaws are, are some of the key problems with what you've highlighted. Yes. And I'm wondering whether you've been in touch with municipal licensing about enforcement of our littering bylaws in the um, Other than putting in calls with 311, um, the only thing that happens is a call to the apartment buildings themselves, and they are only required to clean up their own property. They don't uh, reach out into the ravines. And when we talk to the uh, building management, the, um, like Q Residential, and we ask them uh, if they can help us clean the ravines in their backyard, they say, we do not want to deal with any other stakeholders. We only talk to the city. And this is where the problem is. People are not able to talk to each other. And that's why we need a, a ravine unit who can connect stakeholders, property managers with um, advocacy groups like ours. So in the areas that you've cleaned up, is there at least signage alerting people to the maximum fines? Yes, no dumping signs. Guess there's not, everywhere in not working there, but there's no enforcement. Yeah. So uh, just one other quick question. Um, I noticed the topography uh, in which you're cleaning up can be yes. quite, quite rough. This I, is around Thorncliffe Park steep, mostly. Steep slopes and a lot yes. of debris. Uh, do you have um, uh, any problems with, with injuries or, or getting that physical? There's a lot of garbage or getting that out of a deep ravine yes. and getting it back up to street level. I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because um, uh, with a thousand volunteers, having them on steep hill slides which are, which are slippery and you're dealing with garbage that is dangerous, um, we are uh, basically, we are very trained and experienced in this. We trained um, volunteer captains who were uh, team leaders who were briefing each and every volunteer on how to do this. They had to sign a waiver. They, um, they were beforehand briefed with all the risks, what to do, what to wear, what not to do. So we, were, uh, we had zero incidents with over 1,500 uh, volunteers in the last two years. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Pasternak. Councillor Ainsley, questions? Uh, thank you, through the mayor. Um, first, I want to thank you for organizing all this and all the volunteers. It's a lot of hard work, and thank you. I'm sure, headaches for your 
yourself. Um, so you said you had to get a, a permit from the city for six hundred dollars. Yes. And then three hundred dollars for insurance. That's right. And then more money for porta potties. Uh, porta potties. Uh, the um, fortunately the um, the permit was waived because council, uh, councillor Paula Fletcher stepped in to cover the costs for the per, uh, for the permit. But I mean we're po out of pocket spending money on on putting up uh, fencing. Where this is all out of our pocket. We had to do a fundraiser online to uh, to ask people to donate some money, and we're putting up fencing, and it's working because behind the ravines we're seeing less trash now. And why did you have to put up the fencing? Was that a requirement? Um, because the, there are a lot of gaps in the uh, in the fences. We've monitored these places um, every every month. We're counting how much garbage comes into it. Why is there garbage? People sneak in uh, behind the fences through holes that are uh, man-made or sometimes um, just old. It's old, but it's uh, we're plugging the holes and blocking the entrances where people uh, go into the ravines where the, there are no official trails. So we're keeping people out of the ravines where they're not supposed to be. Okay, and this and that's you're leaving it behind like that's once you're done the cleanup day that that's fencing staying there. It is still there, yes, and but this is with the consent of the um, the uh, the, um, the property owners in this case. Okay, all right, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Nuziata. Yeah, just I just want on one point. You showed us a picture of the high rise apartment and they had their bins with their litter flying everywhere yes. right and i have a lot of that as well yes. but um have you spoken to your local councillor that we can enforce them uh to have an enclosed an enclosure for their yes i've spoken to councillor robinson which is her ward this is her ward uh we've requested a follow-up meeting to discuss these uh, these matters and we have not been granted a meeting not yet, but we have a plan actually with um, uh, Ryerson University. There was a study done last year uh, with recommendations and observations of how we can prevent the litter spill from coming. And part of their recommendations was that uh, the bins are, um, are a, lo a lot of them are broken. The lids are not put on properly. There's no enforcement and uh, the pickup through GFL, when they pick up about 10% of the garbage spills, that does not get picked up, and the wind just blows it right yeah, into no, the I, ravine. I understand, yeah, but in some of these buildings, you're right, they should be enclosed. We should enforce enforce that, that yes. they need to be enclosed, because there are there is litter flying everywhere if it's not an enclosed. Thank Correct. you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Nuziata. Any other questions of the deputy? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Van Top. We appreciate all of your efforts, too, in, uh, in helping us look after the ravines. Uh, Linda Brett, Bloor Street East Neighborhood Association, followed by John Bossons, Midtown Ravines, and Dave Harvey. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mayor and members of the committee. My name is Linda Brett, and I am the president of the Bloor Street East Neighborhood Association. Our footprint encompasses part of the Rosedale Valley Ravine with three bridges spanning the ravine. Bina is pleased to see the ravine implementation report and the support it has received from the federal government. We fully support staff recommendations. However, we request amendments to recommendation two. And the first one and the uh, second one, or the recommendation 2B, we believe will be addressed. However, we're here mostly to talk about recommendation two, uh, 2A with respect to the litter clean cleanup, and we would like to see that the transportation right-of-way lands around the bridges and under the bridges be included in the biannual litter cleanup, which is currently the responsibility of transportation services. We support the concept of a dedicated review unit within the parks, forestry, and rec recreation, which would coordinate the work recommended within the study. We would recommend that this, this, that this unit either A, coordinate the two recommended litter cleanups a year with transportation services, or transfer the current cleanup responsibilities of transportation services to parks, forestry, and recreation and associated funding as, as it applies to the ravines. The reason, uh, the reason for our request is demonstrated by the recent sweep of the ravine and resultant fire under the Sherburne Bridge. The sweep of homeless encampments and litter cleanup on January 7th by, by our observations did not include the areas around, un, uh, around or under the Sherburne or Mount Pleasant bridges. On Sunday, January 12th, the fire broke underneath the Sherber, Sherburne pr pr uh, Bridge, and I have pictures of the fire itself. There's the fire. 
These are the pictures of the litter that was not cleaned up and ended up on fire, quite a substantial fire. So this is five days after the sweep and cleanup. The bridge was closed. Hazardous Waste Toxic Materials contractor cleared the area under the bridge last week. Contracted engineers have inspected the bridge and the bridge is now cleared and reopened. We're lucky that we had no fatalities. We're lucky that the bridge could be that what the bridge could be reopened so quickly, but this is an accident waiting to happen without a coordinated cleanup. We're looking, we're looking to you to recommend closing up what we see as a deficiency in the interdepartmental work coordination by our request. A more detailed submission was uh, submitted to you with a copy of our submission to the bu Budget Committee, which was far more de detailed than today. And finally, I've got a couple of minutes left. You'll see by our letter that we are very pleased to see re the ravine strategy. Although this is a picky area and small within it, it's important to us. But we also have very aspirational plans for the Rose de Valley ravine and how it can coordinate into a recreation area and a revitalized area of the City of Toronto to serve the needs of those of, mid, of the middle of Toronto, which is growing in size as well. Thank you very much. Thank so you, I Ms. Took Rett. Extra time. Uh, are there any questions of the deputy? All right, seeing none, I'll thank you very much for your time. Uh, John Bossens, Midtown Ravines Group, Dave Harvey, and Jonas Hamburg, University of Waterloo, are the next three. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I have with me Tim Ross, who's number 18 on the list. Uh, we would like to be able to appear together, if we may. Is this Mr. Ross right here? Yes. yes. Yeah. We can accommodate that uh, if, with the indulgence of all those who come before uh, number 18, because I th if it's going to expedite our proceedings, that's terrific. And do you want? Uh, will you then take six minutes, or to, for the two of you, or will you take? We may. Pardon me? You have six minutes. Okay, well, that's fine. Sure. Any, uh, it'll, it'll be taken with a great uh, it, it'll be more positive reception if you take less than six minutes, but that's fine. You take the time. You both are entitled to three, and uh, oh. tell me when you're ready. We'll try. We did plan for ten, but we'll, we'll try and get, every, right. get within right. six, less if we can do so. Thank you very much. Well, John gets ready. Mr. Mayor, uh, my name's Tim Ross. Uh, yes. We're representing the Midtown Ravines Group. Um, I'd just like to thank you and the members of the committee for this opportunity this morning. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence here today of other members of our Midtown Ravines Group and of its uh, constituent RAs. We're delighted uh, that people have come out to participate today. I'll start again if you're ready to start. Yes. Thank you, sir. Um, as you can see, we are the Midtown Ravines Group, and this the map that uh, uh, is behind you just indicates the, the area. Um, uh, this is actually, as it turns out, one of the areas uh, that are designated as a priority area, uh, one of the ten uh, in the report. Uh, why we are here? Uh, we are here because we want to support the staff recommendations and your uh, proposal, Mr. Mayor, uh, to accelerate uh, the uh, increase in the operating budget so that work on uh, litter cleanup and uh, invasive controls can start immediately. Uh, it's really important, uh, and uh, uh, we also want to support, of course, the increase in the capital budget that's to begin in 2021. Uh, we also have some other uh, recommendations we would like to do. Uh, I, I'm just, I, I think I've said this, so I'm just going to skip ahead. Uh, urgency. We are losing our ravines to erosion. Uh, this is just one of many pictures we could show you uh, of what's happening just in the ravines in our area. And this is a problem that's endemic to the whole city. Uh, it's, uh, so uh, the uh, the allocation of $105 million as an addition to uh, the 10-year capital investment plan is crucial. And uh, uh, in combating erosion, in providing for uh, repair of decaying and deteriorating parks, infrastructure, etc. So uh, uh, we strongly support this. Likewise, the uh, uh, 
growth of invasive species, which are rampant. Mr. Mayor, of course, the, the, the urgency speaks to the acceleration, uh, which we wholeheartedly support, uh, in addition to the recommendations as a whole. So thank you and everyone for all the hard work that was put into them. We'd like to, if we could, just take a very quick time to highlight some of the additional benefits of moving forward with these proposals. Um, you know, we, we see this as a big move that the city is making. Uh, it, it's very welcome. Um, we think that this is a, a great leadership opportunity for, for the city. Um, and, and I think it would really allow for the city to engage uh, more deeply. Uh, Mr. Ross, excuse me one sec. There's just a, quite a bit of conversation happening over here. And if I could just ask you to step outside if you're going to chat or just try it because it's hard to hear the deputy. Sorry, go ahead. By all means. Um, and anyway, we'd like to encourage the city to think about if it moves forward with these recommendations, the manner in which that will allow for greater productive engagement with other groups. And there's three that I'll mention very quickly. First, the ravine users and community groups. Uh, second, the private landowners. Um, it's important to emphasize that 40% of the ravine lands are in private hands. Uh, therefore, 40% of the problem, uh, I think, remains to be addressed. Um, but we, we put the Toronto Lands Corporation, by the way, in that category. You know, there are schools and other properties that touch ravine lands. Um, in, in the third group, through you know, for further engagement, I, I would say is the province of Ontario. Uh, I think if the city makes this big move, it can it can fairly turn to the province and say, where are you guys on this? Um, and, and I'll come back to the, those the private landowners and the province of Ontario in a minute. Um, and and people have spoken uh, very well about ravine users and community groups. I won't uh, say anything other than they're highly motivated. Um, they're they're highly skilled. Um, and the motivation, I think, should be shared by the city. The invasives and erosions, uh, erosion, um, they're a very real threat to the city infrastructure that's in the ravine system. That's water infrastructure and recreational. Uh, the city's making big investments, and, and, and working on remediation is going to protect those investments. And I'll, I'll also highlight that, you know, our group studies things happening in other places, particularly the United Kingdom and the United States. Um, it, 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 on Japanese knotweed, there are places in the UK where you cannot insure property where uh, Japanese knotweed is present. They have a more uh, advanced problem, uh, frankly, than we do. It's, it's a very real issue. Um, Irene Vandertop, in her submission uh, a couple of deputants ago, uh, emphasized some of the problems that citizens have in being able to uh, contribute their time and effort uh, to uh, help uh, in uh, what the city is doing in the ravines. Uh, th some of the impediments to citizen help uh, include excessive concerns about city liability. Uh, there, uh, we suggest that there's a lack of effective protocols for citizen work, that more needs to be done in figuring out how to make this work better, uh, that, that we, we suggest that the city investigate ways in which they can certify people that have expertise, uh, provide training for people, uh, and indeed, you know, essentially do the kind of things in the training and certification area uh, that Irene was talking about. Uh, we are, we have incorporated in order to uh, raise money and uh, enter into contracts, for example, with the city. Uh, we need private support. We're very excited about uh, the round table that is proposed. That's excellent. But that is oriented to raising money for park assets. We also want to support park opera operations, such as, for example, invasive control. That's not an asset that, that people are, uh, large donors are generally willing to support. But uh, we believe we can raise money for that, and we need help from the city in order to be able to do that. Now, we're just, uh, just so you know, I saw that there's some recommendations. I'll have to ask you to sort of either take those as read, because we're at the six minutes. Right. And I have yes. to be fair, because there's so many people to be heard. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, I'll just skip to the recommendations. They, you have our letter before you. Uh, they're on page four. So I'll just very quickly say that what we recommend is, first of all, that uh, you support uh, the Ravine Implementation Report and support the Mayor's proposal. Uh, we, uh, uh, we also have a number of detailed recommendations. And given the time, I think I will just say, refer you to our letter uh, and ask that uh, you ask staff to report on them. Thank you. And, and I thank you very much for your interest in this and for being here. And are there questions of this deputy? Uh, the two deputies, I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Pasternak. Uh, just very quickly, Mr. Mayor. 
and I must admit I was, I was counting on uh, Councillor McAlvey here to tell me anything I missed, but private lands. Um, Forty percent of our ravines are on private lands. How do we shape policy on private lands? This is a question I'll ask for staff later. Okay. okay. May I? Yeah, you go ahead and I'll, let me just, you go ahead and I'll follow. Um, we, we've been trying to figure it out. It's not a straightforward um, uh, question. One of the things we've observed is that there are existing provincial programs that are mostly applied outside of urban areas. One of them is called the Conservation Land Tax Incentive Program. Uh, there's another one called the Ontario Managed Forest Program. Um, we're, we're not sure if their applicability is perfect for ravine lands, but we think it's a good place to start. Um, and, and this is really what we're, we'd like to ask the, 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 the city to consider is engaging with the province and other stakeholders and, and just observing that people have worked hard to figure out a lot of the same problems that we're faced with in these other areas of Ontario. Maybe we can bring some of that to the city. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I may thank also, you, just, thank you. oh, you want to add to it? If I may just follow up on this, yeah. I mean, one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons why uh, we organized uh, this consortium is also to involve private landowners in the process. Uh, we've, uh, uh, we have, through the uh, uh, Toronto uh, Ravine Revitalization Study, uh, they have hired a student uh, to, the, who has interviewed all of the landowners that abut the ravines in our area. Uh, what we need to be able to do is, uh, is get them involved. Uh, we see that as really one of the rationales for our existence. And uh, uh, so we think it's very important that we, together with uh, city parks, uh, approach them. Uh, there's no point in having, for example, an invasive control program that ends at a fence that's halfway up the slope. We need to involve the private landowners, and it, we think it's very important that you encourage groups like us to reach out to the private landowners and bring them in. Okay. Now, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Councillor Pashnak. Other questions of the deputants? Okay. Well, thank you both very much for your submissions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor. That moves us next to Dave Harvey, uh, <coughs> Jonas Hamburg, University of Waterloo, and Andrew Simpson. Thanks so much. And if I can just uh, speak uh, just very quickly to the previous item, I just want to thank the mayor for his leadership on Rail Deck Park. It's an incredibly needed park, and keep it up, keep going. <laughs> Um, I'm uh, the Executive Director of Park People. We're a charity that helps people activate the power of parks to improve quality of life in cities across Canada. Partnering with city, funders, and local agencies, we support over 100 community groups across Toronto to turn their parks into dynamic community spaces supporting nature and connecting communities. Many of these groups are active in Toronto's ravine systems. Park People strongly supports the Ravine Strategy Implementation Plan being considered today. Too often we see excellent strategies and plans from the city without getting the resources that they need. This is a great first step. Uh, and, and it's also great to see that the funds are being used by PFR for new resources and that these are being gonna, gonna be considered to be moving those funds up uh, for 2020 instead of waiting for 2021 on the operating side. The choices for the top 10 priority investment areas for capital projects are excellent. Uh, we're really thrilled to see that the priority consideration are given to ravines that are outside the downtown and that we're going to be bringing some of these capital projects into some of our un underserviced neighbourhoods. These capital projects also need to be fast-tracked. Um, we also really welcome the Mayor's decision to appoint Councillor McKelvey as the lead person on the, uh, on the uh, ravine strategy. You've got some fantastic ravines in your ward and we look forward to working with you on that. Um, we are big supporters of the Ravine Campaign and its two initial elements, the Trail Loop and the Into the Ravines program. The Loop has the potential to be a great new green connector around the city, building on the fantastic, incredible Meadowway and the new trail systems in uh, Roos National Urban Park. Park People is excited to partner with Parks, Forestry and Recreation on the creation of the pilot Into the Ravines program that was mentioned earlier by Janie. Uh, Into the Ravines will support community groups to engage with residents in ravine activities and programming, connect the people of Toronto with the ravines, and give them a deeper understanding of the ravine ecology and Indigenous knowledge. We're particularly excited about the focus on reaching out to communities outside the downtown in underserviced neighbourhoods, reaching new people, building the foundation for a long-term sense of connection and care for Toronto's ravines. And we really look forward to working with Parks, Forestry and Recreation staff on developing the program and working with many of the organizations that are here today and other groups that are right across Toronto and working in their communities from the Humber to the Rouge. Thanks for your consideration and uh, thanks for moving this forward and thanks so much for the staff of PFR for putting together an excellent plan. 30 seconds early. Thank you. <laughs> Questions of the deputant, uh, Councillor McKelvey. 
Uh, thank you for your deputation. Mm. And you mentioned specifically outside the downtown core as well. Um, what do you think we need to do to help build capacity in citizens um, outside the core in some of those other neighborhoods so that we can have them engaged in this ravine strategy as, as fully as, as others? Well, as Janie um, Romoff mentioned, uh, particularly some of these areas, there's some you know, incredible ravine systems outside the, outside the core, but some of the access are very challenging. And uh, there's some capital things that you can do, but it's very, you know, some, you know, we were talking about Thorncliffe Park earlier, and it's a beautiful ravine right beside a really, a neighborhood that can really use that kind of access to nature and green space. But the access is, you know, straight down. So to fix that is very problematic. But I think by working with a lot of the community groups that are here, groups like Park People, we can um, be organizing uh, walk programs, different programming to, to bring people down using some of the existing access systems to keep people more comfortable using the spaces in different ways. So I think uh, and a lot of training. And, you know, we've talked, uh, some of the groups today have talked about some of that tension between protecting nature and getting more people involved into the ravines and by educating them and training them and, and talking about how to respect the ravines while accessing and embracing that beauty, I think there's some good work that can be done. And so really, I think what you're saying there uh, was an interesting perspective I hadn't really thought of, is that the capital needs are just as important if you really want to build uh, out those recreational opportunities and have uh, citizens engage more with nature in... in Very much go hand in hand, but not, not forgetting that some of those programming side, that can be some of your quick early wins. Some of those, you know, uh, big crisscross uh, access that you need to build are multi-million dollar to make sure that they're accessible and everyone. But some of the programming, you can actually, you know, get uh, boys and girls clubs going down there, and then and the kids can then get their parents to come down, and the parents can get the grandkids to come down, uh, grandparents to come down, and so you can you can actually get people you know more comfortable how to get into the ravines and you know how to get out of them too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKelvey. Any other questions of uh, this deputy? Well, thank you so much for your interest, uh, your ongoing interest, but here also today, I appreciate it very much. Uh, so that would bring us then to the next three, Jonas Hamburg, University of Waterloo, Andrew Simpson, and Hamza Rustam. Uh, you are, I, I presume, Mr. Hamburg? Yes. That's Perfect. Me. Welcome. Uh, All set to go, or? Yeah, I'm just uh, wondering how I said. Oh, there you go. There we are. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jonas, or Jonas. Um, I'm at the University of Waterloo, but I actually just moved to York Centre about a week ago. Um, I'm a PhD candidate, and uh, I use thermal cameras on satellites, um, the International Space Station, and on drones uh, to look at uh, temperature in natural areas. I was asked uh, by the ravine Revi revitalization uh, science team to be here today uh, to give a little bit of relevant research. Um, so we have some hot days ahead. Um, it's expected that we will have an extra week of 30 plus degree days by 2030. That's in 10 years. Uh, in 2018, the heat wave uh, killed over 70 people in Montreal. And uh, heat waves tend to hit the poor and the old the hardest. Um, the air around us is heated from the ground up. When it hits pavement or rooftops, uh, it just sort of bounces back, heats up the air. When it hits vegetation, some of that is used for photosynthesis, some of the energy is used for transpiration, and uh, to grow the plants. And the more plants and the more diversity of plants, the more transpiration, the more photosynthesis, it sort of works like a water-cooled AC. All that water coming up cools the air around it. And the more types of plants means more Different angles, different heights, also means different times of the season. You have some plants who photosynthesize more early in the season, more in the middle, more late. Uh, in my own research, I've found that when controlling for the total amount of biomass, as in the total amount of plants, uh, even when you control for that, each new species decreases temperature by about half a degree. And in this, um, this can be a little bit scary, but uh, on the left, on the y-axis, you have relative temperature on the x-axis, native and exotic diversity. With more native diversity, temperatures drop faster than with exotic plants. Why is that? Well, uh, native plants are better adapted for our conditions. Uh, they have evolved for the area. 
and they use the energy better that way. Uh, so this is a, a look at Rouge Valley um, from 1985 to 2019. Uh, the areas in purple are areas um, of interest to the TRCA. And what we see here is areas where there's been residential or mixed development or industrial development have increased in, in summer, this is summer temperatures, uh, by up to 10 degrees or, or more. Um, while areas, you can uh, sp specifically look at the former Bear Road landfill, which is now part of Rouge Park and has been restored, has decreased by over five degrees. So these are pretty big numbers. All of the lower Rouge watershed has increased by 1.5 degrees in uh, 35 years or so. Uh, and uh, Rouge Park, though, because it was restored naturally or restored you know, with native plants, it has decreased by 6.3 degrees. I'll have to ask you to conclude yep. uh, if you're oh, close sorry. there. Thank you. Uh, Restoring urban islands, urban cool islands, provide access to all ravines. Uh, it's a health and equality issue. My ask is just increased funding to restore diverse native vegetation. And uh, talking about what you talked about earlier, I just threw this in. This might be another argument for the railway deck park. It could substantially cool downtown. And if you... I'll add it to my list. Yeah. And on that note, uh, I will thank you for your deputation. Thank you. Sorry that we just have Sorry, to keep uh, tabs at the time here. Are there any questions of this deputy to uh, Councillor McKelvey? Uh, thank you for your deputation. I think you mentioned remote sensing. Yes. Okay. Uh, so is LIDAR currently the state of science for vegetation detection um, and um, drone technology? Like, where is the state of science at right now on that? LIDAR is one way that you measure the height of, of plants. Uh, I use thermal cameras, so I look at the temperatures. But I know the TRCA uses LiDAR. I think they have drones with LiDAR cap capability. LiDAR is light, yep. is something sort Detection of like radar, but with radar, light. Yeah. Um, so when you, you're talking about like planting, and do, what, what do you think the standard should be for percentage vegetation cover? Because right now, we're aiming for 40% by 2056. I'd, I'd like to see that 2050, so it aligns with our climate goals. But yeah. is there, what is the hard and fast number in the state of science on that? Uh, the more the better. Uh, I don't have a particular, but like I said, the uh, if if this railway deck park was built in 20 years, that area would probably be cooled by you know five degrees. Um, and but I, I can't say an overall number for the city. For the number, okay. Um, and so, do you have, for example, um, answer like CRD grants with cities at all, or like have you thought about moving in that sort of direction? Because I think there's a lot of potential for or collaboration through some of the new, I know NSERC is overhauling the new strategic grants program. Yeah. Um, and I think it's worth looking at because I think that um, like what you're doing with the drone technology to kind of help us to set what that standard should be at could be very informative. So I just wanted to see if you thought about moving in that direction or you're already working with cities collaboratively. Sure, I'm actually, um, I moved to Toronto because I'm hopefully getting a postdoc uh, with, through my tax with the TRCA and okay. University of Toronto. Uh, so it would be a collaboration there would love more money. <laughs> right, right. I'm barely earning enough for my rent here. Yeah. Expensive but city. I think right now we're we're getting our vegetation from point source boots on the ground and right. not necessarily from surveying. So I think it I think there's a lot of value to remote sensing. Uh, both satellite, international space station and drones. You can, there's part of the city you can't use drones in because you're too close to the airports. Right. Um, but there are other parts where you definitely could. And in terms of cost, has this, I mean, it, LIDAR and thermal, it used to be quite expensive. Has that come down? Like, is uh, it Satellite is basically free. Okay. Um, I mean, it's not free to shoot up the satellites, but the data the is, free, is yeah. publicly available through NASA. Uh, I know the uh, Can Canadian Space Authority doesn't have a thermal camera itself, but it's all international collaborations anyway, so. But the geologic survey does. A USGS or the Canadian. The Canadian. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they have thermal. They probably have LIDAR, LIDAR. and they have radar. And each country specializes in, in certain things because okay. it would be stupid to, for everyone to do everything. Right, right. Okay, well, let's, I, I, I'm out of time, but I think there's potential for collaboration between yourself, the city, and uh, oh, I would love the Canadian Geological. Yeah, Theory. and uh, I've talked with to, uh, the overhaul of NSERC and what NSERC's doing because, like, yeah. with their changes, I think. That's opening that door. I would, I would love to, to do that. Yeah, I'll follow up with you after. Okay, All right. thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Amberg, thank you. Unless there are any other questions, we'll uh, thank you very much for your time and your uh, deputation and answers to questions uh, and move to uh, the next three, Andrew Simpson, Hamza Rustam, and Rashid Adam. So uh, Andrew Simpson is next. Good morning, Mayor Tory, members of the Executive Committee, staff, and fellow citizens. My name is Andrew Simpson. I'm a resident of Ward 14 in Riverdale and a regular user of the Don Valley. But I'm speaking today as a longtime steward both with Evergreen and the City of Toronto Community Stewardship Program. I really want to thank the staff for the very comprehensive report. It covers some really important issues that intersect in our ravines. So I just want to start with a few things that I really liked uh, that I read. First of all, the acknowledgement of the role of the Indigenous community in the ravines. There is potential for Indigenous people to use the ravines for their cultural and spiritual practices that could play a meaningful and authentic step toward reconciliation. Please uh, allow this to happen. Uh, number two, the Loop Trail. I love the idea of going on an 80-kilometer bike ride within city limits and completely off-road. This bold vision will attract philanthropic partners and engage people to get into the ravines. But let's be cautious about adding paved surfaces and avoid crossing uh, environmentally sensitive areas. So we need to strike a balance there. Uh, partnership. I'm really happy to see the city recognizes the need for everyone to be working together toward these goals. So um, some suggestions. Uh, number one around partnership with community groups. We've been a bit of a theme we've heard this morning about how to make this easier. Um, city could unleash a huge amount of free labor by giving approved groups more freedom to do stewardship work without direct staff supervision. There's a huge limitation by requiring the city's staff to be present at all activities. And this will always be the constraining factor, and it need not be this way. One approach would be to have a program of certified ravine captains who can supervise a predetermined set of low-risk activities, for example, pulling weeds in flat areas. However, staff would continue to be required if working in ESAs, on steep slopes, or using specialized equipment. Captains could come from existing stewardship groups, as well as academic programs like forestry, ecology, landscape, architecture, and botany, as well as um, indigenous knowledge keepers. Uh, number two, a database of stewardship opportunities. I envision a web-based application that would bring together three important components. Number one, the landowners, both private and public, as we talked about earlier. Community or corporate groups who have volunteer hours to donate. And experts, landscapers, ecologists, foresters, to plan and supervise the work that would be approved by city staff. And you could also leverage the city's open data platform and plug into the civic tech community to provide the development of this website. And number three, conservancy. There are many references in, in the report to an external philanthropic partner. And to me, it seems like a logical fit for a conservancy model to be created. The conservancy could play multiple roles. Fundraising and disbursement to local stewardship and friends of groups leading community engagement, and also being the facilitator between the city forestry staff and the community groups doing restoration and cleanup work. And I'll have to ask you on that note to wrap up. Uh, okay, yeah, in conclusion, spring's coming. Let's get this approved and let's start working this season. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Uh, questions of the deputy? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you heard some applause there. We're not supposed to have that, but somebody uh, liked your presentation, including me. Thank you very much. Uh, Hamza Rustam, Rashid Adam, and Sami Murad. So, Mr. Rustam is first. Are you, Mr. Rustam? Uh, you are. Okay, fantastic. You're here first, and you're up first, and you've got three minutes. And thank you very. Are you all? Do you want to just present together? Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right, and, and uh, there'll be a bonus uh, bo bonus prize if you can present in less than, because you're entitled, because you're all here separately in, to nine minutes. But if you could do it in less, that would be well received. Five. Five. Just because we're trying to keep things moving along, because there's lots of people waiting to be heard. Okay. Yeah, credit, we'll give you a credit for the next meeting. That's one of his offers that nobody would take. But anyway, uh, uh, thank you very much for being here. There, away you go. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Before I start, uh, 
First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak here today. Me and my friends are first year students at York University studying environmental studies. And after hearing about the, this project today, we came here wanting to show that we care and that this project is very important to us. I just wanted to say how pleased we are with the Toronto Ravine strategy and look forward to more projects like this in the years to come. This is the type of projects that we want and are proud to see because protecting the environment is our responsibility and without it we wouldn't be able to live happy and healthy lives. With the green spaces we are able to interact with nature and are able to escape the city life that makes us estranged from nature. With this plan we could look forward to having Toronto's ravine staying here for a long time and it's something we look forward to. I hope that this plan can help increase awareness to more environmental issues such as water and air pollution for example and that the government will put more resources in tackling these issues. Thank you. So adding on to what my fellow classmate has stated, uh, the very importance of the strategy is crucial to the environment and Toronto as, um, a, as a whole city. When 87% of Toronto's environmentally significant areas are found in ravines, and ravines are about 17% of Toronto's uh, land area, it is not a small or easy task to accomplish. To the looks of it, these ravines are essential to the health and beauty of Toronto and the ecosystems that lie within. No other city on the planet has a ravine system like Toronto's, and um, this plan is key on protecting such a valuable asset. We know that this strategy consists of five, five main uh, steps or parts. Uh, to protect, invest, connect, partner, and celebrate. And I believe that to the best of my understanding, each component is achievable, and that others like my friends and I would be on the side to advance this project and even help in spreading awareness and uh, the importance on uh, the ravines in Toronto. And um, part of the plan is also to uh, get acknowledgement from the community and from uh, property owners where uh, ravines are present. And I feel it is our responsibility to spread the word about ravines to communities and to people that may not think about green spaces, with, green spaces within their daily uh, routines. And if more and more people are aware or become aware of this project, I feel that there would be an increase in satisfaction and um, some extra helping hands that would be crucial when um, executing this uh, project. We also know that one of the hardest parts about this plan is the funding for it. And we believe that this plan should be quite high on the city's to-do list because of the positives and the, envir and the environmental importance it carries, especially in uh, the world we live in today where the climate is rapidly changing. Thank you. Yeah, adding to my friend, what my friend said, uh, in reviewing this report, I have gained a greater appreciation for the value of our ravine systems as the green assets which can be enjoyed, but must also be preserved and protected. Council is to be commended for its leadership in protecting our ravines. It will be important going forward to ensure that ravine, the ravines are protected from development. We need to make sure that development is not permitted too close to ravines as there will be a great risk of destabilizing ravine slope. We are concerned that while it is a good plan, funding has not been allocated for full implementation of the plan. Every effort must be made to ensure to secure funding from other levels of government. We also recommend that advance of the ravines strategies objectives referred to in recommendation eight be reported every three years not every five years. Furthermore, this reporting should uh, identify additional ravines which can be benefited from, from financial investment. The goal is to do more fast. And we are here, like from, from uh, York University, we are available to volunteer as it needed. Once again, we would like to thank you for, your, for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. Uh, you literally used half the time, so that I don't know whether the deputy mayor's suggestion you be given credit for the next meeting would be sort of a painful uh, 
you know, but, but nonetheless, thank you for that. And there may be some questions. Uh, and I, I want to thank you as well for your offer to, you know, for, to get involved in this, but your offer of help, too, because we need a lot of help getting this done. It's not all going to be done by government or anybody else, employees. It's going to be done by people who decide they want to get involved. And a number of the people we've heard from today have been citizens who are interested in this. So I thank you very much for that. It's great. Are there questions of the deputants? Just maybe I could ask you one uh, with respect to the, um, you know, how we should get more people engaged in this, because it's been a challenge for us. Is I think the ravine uh, treasure we have and the need to do a lot of the things that we've seen in some of the pictures and some of the things we've talked about today are little known by people. How, how do you think we could do a better job of having people understand something that they sort of take for granted in the city? Um, I feel that, you know, within our neighborhoods or within our, um, personal uh, interactions, you could say that if we start out small, because before this plan, I know this plan has been drawn up since like 2015 and it's been an ongoing thing, but I haven't actually, like I didn't really know about this plan since let's just say last year. And that's because I didn't know and I didn't know anyone that was actually on board with this. But now that I am on board with this, for whoever that I can speak to, I can personally tell them that this is something that the city of Toronto wants to do. And because of, its, because of how uh, much of a uh, importance it is and how much of a positive it is, I would try and tell within my community, within York University, set up different kinds of um, uh, awareness groups, posters, anything we can like on our level just to raise a little bit more of an awareness. I appreciate that, and if you can, if you want to take a first step in uh, any neck of the woods, whether it's near the university or otherwise, uh, we'd sure. be happy to help you with that. Yeah. Thank you very much again for your interest. Any other questions of the deputants? I'll thank the three of you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next three: uh, Pat Concessi, Darlene McKee, Toronto Camino Community, and uh, Ellen uh, Schwartzel, a Toronto Field Naturalist. So, uh, first is Pat Concessi. While he's looking for an adapter, Darlene, do you want to go ahead of me? Sure. Darlene McKee, I could maybe start, and then we'll get the adapter sorted out. Thank you Thank for your you. patience and cooperation. I appreciate that. Ms. McKee, uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, you are from Toronto Camino Community, and you have three minutes, and we welcome you here. Thank you. So my name is Darlene McKee. I'm a retired library worker and a hike leader. I've been doing it for about nine years, mainly for the Toronto community. When I first began organizing hikes, I used this map, which was really helpful. It has not been produced since 2009, whereas the cycling map gets produced every year. Um, we, our group, has walked parts of all of the major ravines, the Humber, Mimico, East and West Dawn Trails, from the lake to Steeles, Highland Creek, and the Rouge, the entire waterfront from Pickering to Port Credit, and the Leslie Street Spit, just to mention a few. So I keep track of my attendance since September of 2019. That's five months ago. More than 150 people have walked with me. I average about 30 people per walk. That makes about 60, uh, 60 hikes and 1,200 individual hikes in five months. Most of these people have ret are retired, and so I feel that we've helped to improve the physical and mental health and well-being for these people. Since most of the hikes are in ravines and parks, we are major users. For me, as a user and a leader, I want to emphasize two areas that I think need improvement and I did not see mentioned in your report. One is washrooms. From October to May, that's six months of the year, between the lake and Lawrence on the Dawn Trail, there is only one washroom open from nine to two. 
Now, this is an issue of not only accessibility, but also equity. Hikers, and women especially, are hesitant to enter the ravines when they know there are no washrooms available. At the very minimum, there should be porta potties. And the second issue for me is wayfinding signage. The maps online and GPS are not as helpful and reassuring as a map, which is no longer available. The wayfinding maps that have recently been put up between the Lakeshore and Pottery Road on um, the Dawn Trail, about four kilometers, they're really helpful and they should be improved and should be extended throughout the system. So um, our issue is when we enter the ravine, especially alone, in the groups, I know where things are, but when we go in, people go in alone, they don't know where the washrooms are, where they can find coffee, how to get out. So those are my issues. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ms. Kazessi. Are there uh, questions of the deputy? <coughs> Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just very quickly, um, and maybe I missed it, um, but one of the common complaints that comes to my office is people who think ravines are also off leash zones for their parks. Do you find that as a problem in our ravines where a lot of uh, dogs are, 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 are running loose, off leash? Yes. Yes, we see quite a bit of that. We, Pat and I try to notice that. Pat comments on it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Pasternak. Uh, thank you again, Ms. Concessi. Uh, then uh, we Sorry, were back. That was Darlene because we switched. Oh, you're absolutely right. That was Ms. McKee but, and but Ms. Concessi. It's not such a difference because I walk with Darlene's group as well. Well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for being here as well. Thank you to uh, Ms. McKee for her presentation and thank you, Ms. Concessi, for being here. And you now have three minutes. Okay. Thank you. And, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to present here today. I want to start by acknowledging the real project progress on the ravine issue, um, particularly the commitment to monitoring. I'm here today because I'm concerned about invasive plants in the ravine. I'm concerned that the increase in funding won't be enough to stop the invasion. I'm here to ask the city to allow self-managed teams of trained volunteers to remove invasive plants from the ravine. I've been walking Toronto's ravines for more than 60 years. I used to know where to go to find trilliums, and trout lilies, but now it's hard to find them because invasive plants have taken over their habitats. I used to get a feeling of peace and serenity when I walk in the ravines, but now there are times when I find the sheer volume of invasive plants makes me feel anxious and distressed. Children particularly need nature. They need to understand what nature is and they need to understand our interdependency with nature. Now, these comments are from Sharon Lovett, uh, who is one of the High Park stewards. She couldn't be here, but provided her comments to you via email, but I wanted to repeat it here to make sure her message is heard. It's imperative that more people are allowed to lead groups, and additional city staff is to identify the areas that need work, create a plan for how, when, and what needs to be done, and then vet potential group leaders. Once this is done, those leaders with or without city help should organize their volunteers. I work with volunteer gardening groups at several public gardens shown on this map, one of them is Harry's. We routinely remove invasive plants and we have no issue with recognizing these plants. We could easily be doing the same type of work in the ravines. We've even removed Japanese knotweed and sometimes we're working on significant slopes. My ask of the city is number one, to recognize a role for environmental and gardening organizations in training and supervising volunteers to remove invasive herbaceous plants from the ravines. Second, to allow self-managed volunteer teams to remove invasive herbaceous plants from the ravines. And third, to allow volunteers to make a significant contribution to ravine health and resiliency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, right to the second, Ms. Concessi. Well done. Uh, may I see if there are any questions for you? There aren't any, but I thank you very much for your submission and thank for your you. patience as well. Thank you. 
Uh, okay, we had Pat Concessi, Darlene McKee, so that brings us to the next three are uh, um, Ellen uh, Schwartzel, uh, Leslie Gooding, and uh, Julia Mikulski. So uh, Ms. Uh, Schwartzel is next. Yes, here I am, and uh, thanks for having me. And, uh, Sorry, I just uh, beg pardon. Oh, there you are. I'm yes, sorry about I'm, that. I'm Ellen Schwartzel. I'm off, here I... on behalf of the Toronto Field Naturalists. Thank you. And um, uh, first, we'd, we'd certainly like to thank you, Mr. Mayor, for urging a fast track on ravine funding. And I'd, I'd be much more effusive in my praise, but I have to watch the clock. Um, we also do want to thank uh, city staff for their diligent planning on the ravine strategy over the last number of years. It's been a hard slog, but, but we are getting there. Um, third, uh, I do hope that this ravine plan will fully harness the potential for volunteers. This is a theme that you've been hearing about this morning, but, but it, it's a really important one. We at the Toronto Field Naturalists are a very seasoned ravine volunteers. Um, we, we do know how to nurture native wildflowers. We do know how to identify invasives. Uh, our volunteers are active on the ground at Todd Morden Mills Wild Lab, Wildflower Reserve, at Milne Hollow, at Beechwood Wetlands, at the Brickworks, and of course at the Cottonwood Flats monitoring site. Um, and that's just to name a few spots. So, so volunteer teams trained to safely dig out invasives can add oomph to the staff, uh, the work of staff, and, and an oomph factor is clearly what we need. You're hearing that this morning. Um, so so your, your goals on increasing volunteer engagement, they're good. Um, I, I'd say they're, they're very doable and, and you, you, we need to push more on that. And the next step, uh, certainly you've been hearing this theme, is that we need to better certify volunteer leaders. Um, fourth, we ask that you protect our most vulnerable species in ravine habitats. How would you do that? By fast tracking those ESA management plans. You need the training, the outreach, and the protection of those habitats. Let me explain this a little. So our ravines are clearly home to some vulnerable species, and the city's biodiversity strategy has spotlighted some of them for us. You've heard of them, the butternut tree, the piping plover, red side dace, monarch butterfly, and so on. They need safe habitat. And so far, the city has mapped out those most vulnerable areas, and they're called ESAs, environmentally significant areas. So the mapping is a good start. But if the city is proposing to launch its $105 million works project in the ravines, fixing all those necessary bridges and the sewers and putting in 15 kilometers of new trails and celebrating with festivals and, and big events, if the city proposes to do all that work before protecting the most vulnerable areas, then we've killed the goose that laid the golden egg. You've, you've actually, those big work projects, the big machines, the trampling will wreck the very best parts of our ravines, the parts that made them special in the first place. So, so far the city has barely begun the job with only two or three management plans in place underway for those vulnerable ESA sites. But our ravines have 82 ESAs. So each is a vulnerable site, each needs a management plan. Looking up from the outside, we don't see any timelines, and frankly, we can't tell whether the staff are there to get that work done. So we rely on you, members of the executive committee, to advance this and ask Parks, Forestry, and Recreation for a schedule for management plans and deadlines. And we need to see that. Uh, as soon as possible. I'll have to ask you just to wrap up on that. Sure. Note. Well, just finally, I just want to say that the, the Toronto Field Naturalist is willing to step up. If helpful, we can offer to be part of the city's proposed partnerships, outreach, and education working group. We've got the experience there. We've been leading walks in the ravines for almost 100 years now. So thanks very much. Thank you, Ms. Schwartzel. Uh, are there questions of the deputy? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we move then to Leslie Gooding, PNTO. Um, presentation up a bit from what I was intending. Um, mostly I would like to thank, I would like to thank you um, and I would like to thank the staff and I would like to thank all of the people who have been presenting before me who have said a lot of things that I am no longer going to, going to repeat. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the things that occurred to me in looking at the ravine strategy, um, oh I should introduce myself, I am speaking on behalf of Protect Nature Toronto. We are an umbrella group advocating for the protection of wildlife and natural areas across the city of Toronto. Uh, one of the things that I have noticed is the lands covered by the Ravina Natural Features Protection are not monolithic. 
Um, some of them, it seems to me, are robust enough that they can handle um, that they can handle human disturbance given sufficient infrastructure. Um, I don't know enough about that, so I'm going to accept that. But there are we also have many extremely sensitive areas that are so intolerant of human disturbance that they should only be visited by carefully selected, carefully screened researchers. We do have. Um, we do have material that is at that level of sensitivity, and of course, the, the best way to protect it is by land holding. That means it's in our public parks. Um, um, and I guess the so I, to speak a little bit more of protection. Um, protection should be effective, um, and where a natural feature is remote and the hinterland is sparsely populated, if you close a trail, then you pretty much do protect that feature from degradation. When you're in a city, that's not the case. If you have overuse uh, on an adventitious trail and you try to close the trail, you still have overuse. It, um, that putting facilities into, a, into an area that should be protected does not affect protection. Um, and I'm going to, uh, the example of High Park, um, Jenny Davis said about dogs in High Park, we have paper protections that should protect High Park from dogs, um, all the way from the provincial policy statement, because 70% of High Park is protected under that. Um, the, um, the ESA um, activities will be limited to those are, that are compatible with the, with, with the protection and the ecological functions. 70% of the park is covered by that. Um, the bylaw, 60834A2, bans dogs from um, areas from natural areas, including ANSI's um, and ESA's. And r instead of banning dogs, we have put in a facility intended to protect the facility from overuse dogs, but in practice, as we heard from Ms. Davis, we have exacerbated a problem and we are not implementing our own policies to protect high par this particular sensitive natural feature. Thank you, Thank you very much and appreciate your uh, Adherence to the time and your uh, submissions uh, very much, Ms. Gooding. Uh, any questions of the deputy? Then? Okay, well, well, thank you for those comments. Uh, Julia Mikulski is next, and then uh, Laura Curran and Lauren South are the next, uh, sort of those are the next three. Good morning. Still morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Hi, my name is Julia Mikulski. I'm an environmental science student at the University of Guelph. And I'm here today to talk about something that many other people have already talked about. Um, I'm concerned that when the average Torontonian reads our ravine implementation plan, they will not get the message loud and clear that the health of our ravines is in serious jeopardy and that protecting them must be a top priority. So specifically, although the plan does have many um, great aspects revolving invasive species management, I feel as though the plan does not clearly illustrate the severity of the invasive species problem or the urgency of invasive species management. So why should we care so much that our citizens actually understand the invasive species problem? It's because our ravines are riddled with invasive of species. They are everywhere, like Japanese knotweed, garlic, garlic mustard, and dog strangling vine. But today I will focus on one of our biggest offenders, the Norway maple tree. The Norway maple tree is an aggressive invader that creates an environment that only supports more growth of itself. And the thought of this is extremely terrifying. Um, imagine if we have a ravine with little biodiversity that is composed of mainly Norway maple trees. If an ecological disturbance happens, let's say a deadly fungus that targets Norway maple trees, we have just lost majority of the trees in our ravines. So little biodiversity is not resilient and it is not sustainable. On the other hand, a ravine with more biodiversity means more resilience and more climate change mitigation. So now that we are aware that we have an aggressive problem on our hands, we must tackle it with an aggressive solution. And I'm afraid that that urgency is not coming across in the plan. Here are a few ways in which the plan could get the message across clear. Involve data that directly showcases the severity of the invasive species problem in our ravines. 
So a great resource for this is the Toronto Ravine study um, that looked at ravine health over 40 years. In 1977, they found that non-native tree cover was just 10%. By 2016, this number had jumped to 40%, and if no action is taken, this number is predicted to jump to 60% within the next few decades. They showed their data in pie chart format, as you can see here, with color corresponding maps, so that made it really clear for the reader to grasp the severity of the invasive species issue. As a layperson reading this document, I would likely come out of it thinking that our top priority is infrastructure development. Um, I might not get the message that invasive species management is also a top priority and that removal of invasive species is something very easy we can do. <laughs> and finally, the tone of this report <laughs> will trigger the series of events that follow. Um, therefore, it should be one of emergency. However, I feel as if the urgency is not coming across. Um, additionally, if this document was user-friendly, if it wasn't bureaucratic or intimidating, and if it was easy to find online and elsewhere, uh, it would make it a lot easier for citizens to get involved and feel like they're informed on the situation. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms. Mikulski. Uh, are there uh, questions of this deputy? Yes, uh, Councillor Ainsley. Um, thanks for coming in this morning. I, so I just wanted to ask, because sometimes as a, as a councillor, we have issues like Norway maple, for example, um, is considered an invasive species, but we have times at city council where somebody applies to cut their tree down and it'll be a Norway maple, and we're told by our forestry staff it's, it's a healthy, vibrant tree and it has to stay. Mm -hmm. But in our ravine system, you consider them an invasive species? Yes, so I think what you're referencing is that many believe because it is a large tree, it does have benefits such as shade provision or carbon sequestration, and that comes with it just being a large tree in itself. Um, you know, it'd be great if we could remove our large Norma maples that are already there, but also we could let them live out their course, die a natural death. Um, what we should really be concerned about are the small ones. So I actually have some pictures of the small ones that we can really easily remove in our ravines before they cause too much damage. Um, although the large ones provide some of those benefits, their damage far outweighs those benefits. So we could let those ones die, but we need to work out making sure we remove the small ones before they turn into those large ones. Right. And how does, a Nor sorry, how does a Norway maple damage our ecosystem? Like um, here are some points on some of the ways that it does so. Um, mainly, it creates an environment where only other Norway maples can survive. So this is contributing to our lack of biodiversity. Um, in addition, its extensive root system is very shallow and creates a lot of soil erosion. I know another speaker today talked about all of the exposed roots that we see in our ravines. Um, Norway maple is one of those offenders, and so I know that's a big um, concern of ours is all of the soil erosion happening in our ravines. Um, Norway maple, maples are a huge contributor to that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Marator. Thanks, Councillor Ainsley and uh, Ms. Pukowski. I think that's all for the questions, and we appreciate your submissions and your answers. Appreciate it very much. And your interest. Uh, Laura Curran, University of Toronto, Lauren South, University of Toronto, and Justin Rye are the next three. Good morning. Hi. So we're Laura and Lauren. We're together. Okay. Perfect. Uh, try and keep that straight. And well, which is which? I'm Laura. <laughs> Laura and Lauren. Okay, I should be able to keep that straight. So you're most welcome here, and uh, you know you can take your. You came as separate entries, so you can take six minutes. If you take less, I'll offer the same bonus you we offered previously. It's not very attractive, but we appreciate your being here. Go ahead. All right. Is it so we. It should be. There we go. <laughs> So Laura and I are here today to speak with you about Japanese knotweed, which has been mentioned before, and we also mentioned it when we were here in September. Um, because we spent all summer studying it in Moore Park Ravine and Park Drive Reservation lands in Rosedale, Toronto. So Japanese knotweed is an invasive plant regulated under the Ontario Invasive Species Act. It's also, the ravines that we studied are also environmentally significant areas. So um, pictured here is uh, the work that we did this summer, which involved mapping the ravines using geographic information systems. And these were our results. The total amount mapped was approximately 4,000 meters squared of Japanese knotweed, which is equivalent to about three and a half Olympic-sized pools. 
As you can see, that's a lot of Japanese knotweed. From this pie chart and zoomed in image of our map, you can see that 62% of the Japanese knotweed mapped is on city land, which makes this a city problem as well as a ravine resident problem. Laura and I believe that a successful management plan should include a private public partnerships. This is just a snapshot of two ravines in Toronto, but we can infer that this is an issue in Toronto's whole ravine system. We need to act now to prevent this invasive plant from causing more damage. We acknowledge and are grateful that the Rosedale Ravines have been included as a priority investment area in the Ravine Strategy Implementation Report for Action, as seen there. Because our expertise is in Japanese knotweed, we're going to use it as an example today. Japanese knotweed devastates both infrastructure and native ecology. Although it is a large problem in the ravines, Japanese knotweed is also prevalent in city alleyways and even in people's yards. Japanese knotweed causes structural damage to building foundations and to other great infrastructure. This is because it can grow through up to eight centimeters thick of concrete. Japanese knotweed also poses a risk for local ecology. This summer, we have seen evidence that it is destabilizing stream banks. It reduces native biodiversity, shades out other species, effectively creating monocultures, and increases the risk of erosion as compared to native vegetation. Many other invasives have similar impacts. The Ravine Strategy Implementation Plan is for a 10-year period. We need to make sure that we cover all our bases with this plan because so much can change in 10 years. These statistics show just how much has changed in the ravine so far. Buckthorn, another invasive, has doubled in abundance in a decade. But, um, invasive shrub cover overall has also doubled in the same time. Nori maples, an invasive tree that Julia talked about, has increased from 10% in 1977 to 40% in 2017 and is predicted to increase to 60% by 2050 if nothing is done. We have noticed that the Ravine Implementation Report has a lot of great overarching goals when it comes to invasive species management. We are looking forward to future plans that more specifically address how this management will be done. So that brings us to why we're really here. We all believe that the ravine deserves protection and we want to see the ravines healthy. And while we think this, that this implementation plan is a good start to tackling the deterioration of our ravines, Laura and I have three key points that we think deserve consideration in this plan. First, the plan needs to recognize that more monitoring is needed for invasive species and that this information should be publicly available. The ecosystem monitoring program proposed in the ravine strategy is well thought out, but we want to make sure that the public can contribute to this program, as mentioned by many other people here today. From our time in the ravines this summer, we've seen firsthand how time-intensive in invasive species management can be. Therefore, we need to ensure that ample resources and funding are provided to this program. Finally, we need to focus on creating private-public partnerships to ensure that 100% of the ravines are being protected. Thank you for your time today, and we really look forward to seeing this plan in action. One and a half minutes under. Uh, <laughs> excellent. Uh, so are there questions of uh, the deputies? Uh, Councillor Ainsley. Um, thank, thank you for the recommendation. So the one that you mentioned about um, invasive species removal. So would you support spraying for invasive species or? I think integrated pest management is a, an important role. So you need to make sure you're doing multiple different methods. Um, but the, the best thing to do is to follow the best practices guidelines um, as shown in the Ontario Invasive Species um, Council. So that there's very clear outlines for how to do that. Um, I'd also suggest partnering with Indigenous communities in Toronto that have many years of experience with this. Okay, and then um, the first recommendation that you both made around um, an outline or you know, a report saying where invasive species were dealt with and monitored and then available publicly. Um, is that something you want to see done? I don't know if it's for your studies at school or? It's more just to, to help the public get involved, especially because we said there's 60% is public land and 40% is on private land. So we know that there needs to be that private-public partnership. And if there was a publicly available map 
that they could see, then you'll know if your neighbor has it in their yard and that it's likely going to be a problem in your yard. So okay. it, could, it could just um, help make the, the program of removal a lot more um, well-rounded. Okay, so it's something you'd like to see like on the... Like city website or something, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you very much, appreciate it. Next, Councillor Ainsley. Other uh, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, thank you for your deputation and coming again. I remember you came to infrastructure. Um, can you just, in terms of the monitoring um, and for the public to be involved in that, can the public also take the next step to remove them? Or is that taking it too far? Like, is it easy to confuse some species or some of them are too noxious? Like, how can we involve the public in the removal part of it? I think that the, the three main species that we see, it's Japanese knotweed, garlic mustard, and dog strangling vine, they're all very distinctive. They, you can tell exactly which species it is. Um, and I think that in addition to monitoring, which we've seen so many people who want to contribute to that, who see Japanese knotweed and want to find a way to report it, um, I think that just basic training will, will permit them to remove the species on their own. So we may be able to target some species for residents to, if you see it, rip it out. Definitely, yeah. Thank you. Depends, yeah, Japanese knotweed, the root system is two thirds of the plant and the plant itself is about two to three meters tall. So it makes it quite difficult to remove on your own, but if you catch it when it's really small, it can be a lot, a lot better. So having um, private property owners remove it while it's young could actually be really helpful. So we do need to target both the private property side of it as well as in the parks. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kel Kelvy. Are there any other questions of the deputants? Okay, thank you very much. We much appreciate your interest. That uh, brings us to uh, Justin Rye and Hamish Wilson and uh, Terry Hong, uh, Toronto Ravine Revitalization Science. And I guess see there's three people from the same organization, so they may want to consider coming up and doing something together, but that's up to them. So, uh, Justin Rye and Hamish Wilson are the next two. Um, hi, I'm Justin Rye, and I am a student that just recently completed my uh, Master of Forest Conservation degree at the University of Toronto. And I'm here today in support of the ravine implementation uh, strategy and as well because I saw an opportunity to share some of the data I acquired throughout the course of my final capstone project, which was focused on Toronto ravines. So most of us here are aware by now of these numbers and how important Toronto ravines are. The city, as well as the TRCA, oversee a large portion of the ravines and are also making great strides in tackling challenges such as anthropogenic stressors and invasive species, serving as stewards of public land. However, I want to focus on the other 40% that is covered by private property because the challenges facing the ravines do not stop at the boundaries between public and private. So just to visualize, uh, here are the ravine and natural feature protection areas under Municipal Code Chapter 658. And for reference, uh, this purple color represents TRCA-owned property with the munis within municipal boundaries of Toronto. Why show this? Because, like the city, the TRCA is doing their best to manage the land and combat existing challenges. Uh, however, again, these challenges do not stop at these boundaries. These orange dots here represent the approximately 30,000 private addresses throughout pr the protected areas in Toronto. From those, around 24,000 are low-density residential properties. We do not know what the owners of these properties are doing. There could be 24,000 property owners with 24,000 different approaches to managing their property. Or worse, there could be 24,000 property owners not doing anything, letting ecological challenges such as the invasive species we've been hearing about today persist. So onto what, what I did, uh, on a student's budget, I couldn't get to all 30,000 private properties throughout the ravines. But I did try and do a little bit of a sample. I went to about 300 addresses throughout these three ravines. That's uh, Cedarvale, Moore Park, and Park Drive. And I delivered a four-page survey trying to find out what private property owners are doing within these ravines. And I got about a little bit over 10% response rate. Uh, the good news. The majority of my respondents indicated that they were actively doing something, whether it's planting natives, removing invasive species, or restoring ecosystem health in some other way. 
Further, while these respondents indicated that being outdoors and improving the aesthetics of their property was most enjoyable, right there with these two aspects was restoring uh, features of natural areas and providing habitat. However, awareness of existing legislation is low, which is concerning because we cannot be sure these individuals are complying with the existing legislation and that their efforts on their own properties are in line with what our public land managers are actively doing. Uh, worse uh, is that the awareness of the property owner's guide was also extremely low. Although I understand that this guide was only distributed to around 10,000 uh, private properties initially, uh, further distribution of this guide is necessary. The formation of the ravine unit to serve as a central hub for private property owners to contact and into ravines, nature at your doorstep, are crucial steps in the right direction. I've left some. Uh, to begin to conclude, to Mr. Rock. Thank you. Uh, these are just some quotes from some of my participants. And to uh, wrap up, these are some more quotes. As I come to a close, I have left some quotes from the participants from my study on the screen. If we are serious about overcoming the challenges at hand and improving the ecological health of the ravines, coordinated efforts are required, not just between city divisions, but also across the boundaries between public and private. Thank you, Mr. Rye, very much. Other questions of the deputy? Uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor uh, Pasternak. Very quickly, I assume you're referring to uh, to this document. Yes. And in your view, it's not getting into ha homeowners adjacent or on ravine properties? Uh, from what I understand, this was initially released only to about 10,000 private property owners, so it's possible that I didn't get the right property owners that received this guide, but I believe there needs to be more done to get this out to people. And uh, as one of my respondents, uh, if I can quote them, it is unfortunate that it is not sent to property owners every two years to make them aware of this as people move into and out of ravine properties. All right, well, maybe that's something we have to address. Yes, thank you, Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, sir, Mr. Rye, very much. Uh, Hamish Wilson is next. In the interest of time, I'll start now. Uh, there's no doubt that we have uh, a, a real issue with uh, the climate emergency and uh, that the ravines are uh, an incredible asset, a common asset as a carbon sink and a refuge in the, uh, the worst of the heat of the summer. Uh, so I'm glad that we're hearing about it. There's also going to be uh, an issue with the uh, increase in storms uh, and uh, the storm surges, certainly in the uh, parts of the Don, uh, about 70% of the uh, uh, water flow surge is from the hard surfaces uh, further upstream. So please work on getting depaving, uh, 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 storm drainage uh, tax, something like that to help uh, 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 redu reduce the storm surges as part of the, uh, uh, the protection measures. Over the years, I think that there's been a change in the air quality that has also impacted what grows and what doesn't grow in the ravine. I could be wrong on this, of course, but this is an old picture of uh, north of Bloor. Uh, I don't think the white pines grow anymore. So in terms of other longer term things that we should be doing to improve the, uh, uh, the status of the ravines, uh, let's clean up uh, how much uh, crap goes in our air. And that also means, uh, because transport leads are greenhouse gas emissions, that we should be trying to keep our options open for uh, improving the transit, uh, which actually has a real precedent. Uh, here's something briefly uh, from the Metro official plan down at the bottom here to use parts of the Don Valley. Uh, and I, as you know, I've been really keen on that, including uh, using parts of the Don, uh, the Don Valley Expressway. Uh, and if I'm advocating for transit through the Don to squeeze the billions, it's not trying to actually build new, but rather adapt what we've got. There's a picture of the Don Valley Parkway with the uh, spur line beside it. There's about 10 lanes, 11 lanes worth there. Uh, so we do need to think about keeping our options open, including in Scarborough. In terms of funding, uh, this is something else uh, that uh, we should be thinking about doing. Uh, do we have a Friends of the Gardener Conservancy group? No. Uh, I don't think it's entirely fair to all the dedicated volunteers to uh, keep them busy and, and just not really support them well enough when we have like 
things like the Gardner, and then again something from 1996 where um, the uh, Vancouver figured out that every car had a $2,700 a year subsidy. Uh, so should we have a vehicle registration tax of 400 bucks each, with 100 going to uh, say uh, Ravine Strategies, 100 for uh, uh, the road repair, 100 for transit? Uh, cars are well subsidized, they're part of our problem, including the salt uh, uh, that blows off or drains down through from, uh, from, the, uh, from the viaduct, uh, and the air pollution overall, uh, if you read something called The Dying of the Trees by Charles Little a couple of decades ago, uh, there's this, uh, a real uh, biological problem of air pollution. Mr. Wilson, thank you. Uh, are there any questions of the deputy? Thanks, Mr. Wilson. Uh, so then we have uh, Terry Hoang, uh, Toronto Ravine Revitalization, Sci Re Revitalization Science, Catherine Burka, same organization, Paul Scrivener, same organization. I don't know if you are able to make any, uh, well, it looks like you're coming up together, but I'll leave it to you as to what you, deal, what you deal with here. You're welcome. All three of you, thank you. How are we going to handle this? Uh, we'll do, uh, we'll be as expeditious as All right, possible. no problem. Okay, off we go. Get it plugged in there. Yes, I am. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. And you've heard many speakers. Uh, our message is uh, pretty simple. But first, I want to say from all of us at uh, U of T uh, Forestry and uh, the uh, Toronto uh, Ravines Revitalization Science Group, uh, to you, Mayor Tory, uh, we appreciate very much your initiative and in taking the lead uh, on this uh, a very, very important issue. And also, uh, I think it's uh, important to acknowledge that there are a number of councillors, uh, Councillor Pasternak, uh, Councillor Layton, uh, Councillor Wong Tam, Councillor Matlow, and uh, Councillor Cole, who have uh, in particular taken this issue under their wing, and their support and encouragement is greatly appreciated. Um, our group came together uh, because of a meeting across the hall in committee room number two in uh, December 2015, and uh, Mayor Tory, uh, you led that off, and that was the round table on ravines. And we happened to link up with some people, Eric Davies and Anki Dong, uh, from U of T Forestry, and um, that's how we got, uh, we uh, produced the most recent study of the Toronto ravines, which was released in 2015. And invasives was the key concern in that study. Um, we're generally supportive of the staff report. Uh, it has a lot of good things in it, good recommendations, and uh, we commend staff in their efforts. Uh, me, as a practitioner in this place, uh, I'm very encouraged that uh, a number of city divisions will be working together to find solutions and uh, to move forward on uh, uh, helping our ravines. Uh, as you know, there are five priorities that have been identified in this, uh, in the staff report to protect, invest, connect, partner, and celebrate. Uh, but as others have said, in reading the report, we're concerned that the protect aspect, which is key, and you've heard from our students about this and others, um, is, is somewhat diminished. And we really, really believe that the funding, the new funding and the $104 million capital fund for the priority areas, um, we need to spend the money up front to protect the ravines, to protect what we have, uh, or the aspects of uh, uh, celebration, connection and so on um, are diminished. If you have a ravine that's full of invasives, um, how is that something to celebrate? Um, if you have a ravine that's full of invasives, uh, why would people want to go there? Um, and the other thing is that uh, we uh, want to point out that ravines are called parks, and uh, some ravines have formal parks in them in their valley floors, but. Uh, most of the ravines actually are quite in their natural state. And it's important that we uh, uh, differentiate a manicured park between a ravine. And I just want to uh, conclude by saying uh, that what we would like to see is that uh, this committee 
ask staff that to, to provide a, um, a report that clearly identifies on how to protect the ravines from invasive species erosion and human impact uh, as a priority item. We don't want the report to be sent back to be reworked. Uh, there's urgency to this. And thank you very much. And uh, I'll pass this on to Hanky. There are two uh, Terry's. Yep. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so the Toronto ravines have the best quality remaining natural spaces in the city, which is vital for biodiversity, ecological health, and resiliency. They are actually the last remaining places um, for native plants and wildlife. Their natural state is what makes them so important. Ensuring that they stay this way is critical. We must keep our ravines biodiverse, healthy, and resilient in a good state so that they can continue to help cool our city, act as natural air conditioners, and help mitigate climate change. The ravines also help filter stormwater and connect into larger watershed systems that help prevent flooding. They also have the majority of the 86 environmentally significant areas in Toronto, meaning it's a place for rare species, unusual landforms, large habitats, and unusually high diversity. So a gem in the city. Biodiversity, ecological health, and ensuring res resiliency in the ravine must come first. Otherwise, its natural features and functions won't appreciate and will diminish greatly. We have biodiversity at our footsteps. Sorry, one second here. The ravines provide a critical habitat for wildlife and native biodiversity and native plants. If you provide a habitat, a home for them, then they are likely to stay. Um, in these next slides, let's just take a minute to appreciate the wildlife and native plants in the ravines. And these were all from um, our Toronto ravines, these pictures. So when the forest encounters invasive plants such as dog strangling vine, their dense patches suppresses native trees and seedlings due to its heavy shading. The forest can't regenerate under these conditions. It also creates a monoculture that doesn't support much wildlife. In fact, the monarch, monarch butterflies can lay their eggs on the dog strangling vine by mistake since it's similar to the native milkweed. And what happens is the larvae actually starves um, and the vine does not provide, as the vine does not provide the necessary food source. Ravines are also negatively affected by erosion. The photo on the left shows a steep slope with hardly any plants. It has leaning trees that sh show slope instability and exposed roots due to its soil erosion. In comparison, the photo on the right shows a healthy ravine with good ground cover, leaf litter, and as well as a slight slope on the ravine edge. Our ravines are under immense pressure from invasive species, erosion, and other factors, and they, must, and they may degrade to a point where they will not bounce back. Protection must be the first priority. Many cities are putting nature first. For example, the Credit Valley Management Plan commits to protecting outstanding natural features through zoning, research, monitoring, resource management, and restoration. Objectives such as appreciation and passive recreation follow. The New York Natural Areas Conservancy also does the same. They put nature first, and they say their mission is for their scientists and experts to promote diversity, resilience, and to enhance health and biodiversity. Greta Thunberg and George Monbeil say protect and restore first and use nature as the climate solution. It's imperative that our ravines stay healthy, biodiverse, and resilient, as they are the last pieces of significant nature in our city. Our ravines should be protected and restored and used as the climate solution. There's another reason, very important reason, why we have to protect and restore our nature, because it's our identity. It's who we are. If you look at the slide, the flag of the maple leaf defines our country as Canadians. It is how we literally export ourselves. When people receive a letter, they see nature on our stamps. It's how the rest of the world sees us. It's also how we see ourselves. It's all over our currency. Our artists paint nature. Our indigenous peoples carve it. You'll see the beautiful work. And even our corporations embrace it in their logos, 
using nature's names and symbols of flora and fauna both. And of course, where would we be without our sports teams? Toronto, this is who we are. Just if you'd look please at the screen. All symbols of nature, the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Toronto Blue Jays, and the Raptors. And just as a side note, the formal meaning of the word raptor actually means bird of prey. Informally, it refers to uh, a type of dinosaur. So all of our sports teams play allegiance to nature and its symbols. We cannot expropriate nature in everything we do as Canadians and as Torontonians and not look after it. If we don't, who do we become? We have taken it for granted. We foolishly expect that it will always be there. If it disappears, who are we? For decades, we've stood by, watched it degrade, benign neglect in the guise of protection. We acted too slowly. We funded too little. Our native maple leaves quickly replaced, were replaced by Norway maples. Our blue jays and our small animals' habitat erodes as we speak. So our raptors, our birds of prey, are going elsewhere for lunch. Ms. Burke, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. I've given you one extra minute because I knew Mr. Scrivener took part of your time. I've known him so long that I knew he would do that. <laughs> he's so he's like that, right? If I can give you just a few seconds to wrap up, then we have to move forward. Thank you. The ravines at present are the most undervalued piece of real estate in Toronto. When you consider how much we have and how little we spend, a recent article in Landscape Architecture magazine put the figure at $370 per acre. Just let that resonate. The current plan will set us on the right path, but it's only beginning. We need to scale the protect and restore efforts in orders of magnitude. These changes require cl clear and decisive action plans, all with relevant metrics. This plan is just the beginning. We hope that this committee agrees with the urgent need to protect and restore, and that your council will work hard to find the necessary funds. As our current elected representatives, the future of these ravines rests in your hands, but we are all here to help. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, all three of you. Uh, other questions of the deputants? All right, hearing none, I will thank you. It was a very complete presentation. We thank you very much. Uh, Cam Collier Evergreen, uh, Jessica Rudolph, and followed uh, last but not least by Daniela Kurek Mudlenovic. So those are the next and the final three before we uh, take a break. Thank you, Mayor. Cam, thank you very much. Uh, nice to see you, and uh, over to you. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Mayor Tory, councillors, staff, and fellow citizens. Uh, my name is Cam Collier. I'm an executive lead at the charitable organization here in Toronto, uh, based here in Toronto, called Evergreen. We've been working in the ravine since 1991. Our first project was in the uh, Lower Don. Uh, we're here today to support uh, the new implementation plan of the ravine strategy. We're thrilled to see the focus, priority, and investment in the ravines. Uh, and acknowledge the hard work of the staff on this uh, report and plan. We highly value the partnership approach uh, and believe it will, be, it will enable new ideas, new resources, broader public engagement, as well as offer opportunities for greater participation of all levels of government. We've seen firsthand the great success of a partnership model as it was applied to our work in the Lower Don Trail over the past five years that has included new infrastructure projects, restoration and stewardship work temporary art installations and interpretive, educational, and cultural programming. Evergreen and its volunteers are committed to working with the city and its partners to celebrate, enhance, and protect this tremendous and globally unique uh, green space asset we have in this city. We strongly support uh, the commitment to engage Indigenous communities in ravine placemaking. We are excited by the potential of the Loop Trail to link so many neighbourhoods in this city. The Loop has the potential to unlock tremendous benefits that will support equitable access, health and wellness, restoration and stewardship projects, active transportation, educational opportunities and cultural offerings. We appreciate that the plan strikes a balance 
between protecting and enhancing the ecology of the ravines while inviting the public to experience them. In the long term, we believe connection and protection go hand in hand. We congratulate the City and support the plan and the proposed additional investment and look forward to working with the City team, the community and partners on the implementation of this plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions of the deputy? All right, seeing none, we'll move uh, next then to uh, Jessica Rudolph. Can we thank you for being here. You're all hooked up. Thank you for Perfect. having me. I'm just a regular uh, Ravine fan, um, and I spend probably 10 hours a week uh, walking in them and about the same amount driving my kid from school, from Spadina and Bloor to Lawrence and Bayview, so I go through a lot of wards. Um, I want to talk today about dog strangling vine. Uh, some of the students talked about having a sense of, of urgency, and I hope to impart that. Um, my first experience uh, with this weed, no, this weed, this invasive species, uh, was about an hour outside of Toronto at his friend's cottage, going for a walk for about an hour. We got into wild places, but there was no other plant. So for one hour of walking, a complete monoculture. It kills everything. There were an occasional tree, but that was it. Uh, it was a bit like a horror movie. Um, but that's what we're up against. This is a plant. This is just one example of the invasive species. Each plant can uh, create Alaska. hundreds of seeds. So it's a problem that advances by orders of magnitude every year. Here are some pictures of it, just carpeting um, the ravines. But sometimes it's a wall. Um, so I want you to understand how uh, widespread it is. Um, it's, it's all through uh, our systems. When I drive my kid, it's all along the south side of Mount Pleasant Cemetery. It's all at Bayview. It's all along um, Sunnybrook Hospital on both sides of the road of Bayview. It's at Glendon. It's Toronto French School. It's the Granite Club. All these prestigious, the Crescent School, these institutions, um, it's on public land and on private land. Um, I, I know time is short and I don't want to bore you. Let me tell you about a conversation I had by fluke with the groundskeeper um, at Glendon. Now, part of the problem is ignorance, that we need to somehow nudge our, our fellow citizens to be able to identify these plants so they can do easy things, like, like pick off the pod heads of the drug strangling vine so we keep it from spreading. But this was the head of grounds keeping, and he said, I know about these plants, but we don't have the manpower to deal with it. And let me tell you just at Glendon, at a branch of York University, how they don't have the funding to deal with this invasive species. You go in through the main doors at Lawrence and Bayview. On both sides, you're surrounded by dog strangling vine. You drive down into the ravine, it's only dog strangling vine. You get to these massive university-sized parking lots, completely bordered by dog strangling vine. You go up the ravine, it's Lawrence East, up to very fancy real estate where Drake lives, Post Road, it's all dog strangling vine. All those fancy mansions around, around um, Drake, it's all there. Um, it's all around Lawrence and Bayview. I live in the annex, it's starting there. Um, so I guess I want to emphasize that in part people are ignorant. When I try to remove it, people are so curious and they come up to me and say, oh, what is it? So we need to somehow nudge people to be able to recognize these species. That would seem to be a cheap thing to do. Um, you are a very popular mayor. People really like you and people... You might you are, not get unanimity in this room on that, but I'll, <laughs> I'll take the compliment. But all of you representatives, right, you're popular in your districts and maybe you could use your prestige to help educate people. Um, there's a lot of confusion about who deals with this. Um, I spoke to a gardening group at Sherwood Park where I walk my dog on leash. Um, and people are confused when I said, you know, maybe instead of planting marigolds, you can deal with these invasive species. They said, don't worry about it. The city is dealing with it. Similarly, there was a house that just abutted the ravine. When I spoke to her, she said, well, I'm keeping it because I keep trying to contact the city and I want them to be able to see what it looks like. I thought it was ironic people up here are talking about these designated protected lands, but they're full of an invasive species that either the public is uh, prevented because it's illegal from removing it, 
or these are in very inaccessible areas. For example, near Sunnybrook Hospital, above the bus shelters, there's some land, and it's all up there. Only a city worker could get to it. Notwithstanding your compliments, I'm going to have to tell you your time is uh, up. I'd okay. love to give I was you a bonus, but then I'd be in deep trouble as chair. That, that, that these are just, this is sort of a lived experience with the ravine, and I hope uh, when I walked out, I heard someone say, oh, I don't need to listen to children. So she left for the beginning. I just hope you do. My kids couldn't be here today, so I hope you will, uh, in their honor, pay attention to the urgency of invasive species. And that's been quite a theme today, and I've learned a lot just from listening to people talk about these, uh, just as our staff have done that in the report. I thank you very much for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputy? No, thank you very much. And then uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, uh, Daniela Pirik Medlenovic. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come. I'm a prof at University of Toronto. My landscape is Southern Ontario landscape, urban peri-urban landscapes. And I'm here in support of the strategy because uh, I really prize the fact that the talks about partnership and monitoring, which are two of the things that I do in my, my research. And um, thanks to the staff uh, from the City of Toronto Forestry and their vision uh, even before the strategy came into place. So we established a, a partnership research and monitoring project uh, 206 plots across uh, 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 Toronto, and as a result of this very positive, unique collaboration, we have uh, multi-purpose information, uh, georeference plots that the same plots as the other 7,000 plots across southern Ontario. So. Uh, we have ability to look at uh, um, all of these issues and lo definitely lots of energy and positive energy coming out, not just unique to Toronto, but I think all of us are tackling climate change uh, and the issues. Um, ability of the, to use these georeference plots, um, the city uh, forestry staff was in very much support because we can use them with remotely sensed information. Uh, and apropos not giving up ever having boots on the ground because we have to teach our youth and our students, which we were doing sampling, um, to know, as we heard from people, dog struggling wine versus the other, remote sensing has some uh, um, possibilities, but definitely it's not a silver bullet. So I'm really looking forward to support the strategy further as, uh, as someone who does applied science and research. Uh, I'm thankful to the City of Toronto staff being brave enough to set the plots and be in the same vein as the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, City of Mississauga, Kitchener, Guelph, Cambridge, Niagara Escarpment. Um, and, and to be honest, uh, even though we tend to hear a little bit old cry, bad stuff. I think uh, City of Toronto, it's again at the leading edge with all those other cities from Southern Ontario and being brave to uh, monitor. Uh, because once when we monitor, we have to react and sometimes results are not what, uh, not what we expected, but we have to respond. And I really praise, uh, praise the city uh, for that and looking forward to support in any way uh, um, monitoring and partnership because we have ability to include um, uh, and work with other groups that I think are very keen in terms of monitoring. Thank you so much. I have to run. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. And, and we, we thank you for your patience waiting. Uh, and, uh, you know, we thank you for that compliment when you talk about uh, the city. But it's been a team effort. And, you know, with great privilege, namely the privilege of having these reviews goes great responsibility and we're all doing it together all these people that are here and the staff that do such a great job and we're just trying to uh, you know sort of carry through on their work so and I said work. I have to run but I, I honestly think what uh, with all fairness 200 years of use of land use development and these are just effects that we see because of the climate change so what we learn from the city of Toronto from science and research and sharing knowledge with other cities so they can uh, maybe prevent some of these things. Some of these things we knew we didn't have money and some of them we never were thinking. Because you think, oh, it's a woodlot. It can take care of itself. Not if you have so much people and pressure. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks for your patience. Yeah. Somebody has to be the final deputy and it turned out to be <laughs> Thank you very much.
Now, I, I think there's probably going to be enough questions to staff and speakers and so on that uh, there's no point in us pressing forward. It's four minutes to the lunch uh, time, and we should adjourn for lunch and uh, Mr. recess for lunch. Yes, sir. I do have a quick item if you sure, want to uh, expend yep, yep. a bit of EX 12.6, the St. Lawrence Centre Redevelopment. The deputants have gotten together and they've all taken the names off. And I just wanted to move this motion that everyone was in support of. I won't read it. It's fairly large, but uh, it's, it's just... And mostly, I think, I, having having seen you were working on something like this, it's about consulting and involving Dire directions on con consultation and, and yeah. moving forward on a, yeah. on a redevelopment Great. of the St. Lawrence Centre. So, uh, uh, Mr. Rosenberg, uh, that's on the digital plan. I think if it just gets us started, yes. Let me just deal with Councillor Crawford's matter first. And uh, so are there any uh, any questions of staff on this? There were no deputations on it that are now still remaining on the list. They've been taken off because they've agreed this is a better way to go. Um, if everybody is content that we should go this way, it takes it off to a sort of multi-stakeholder consultation. And, and I, I do apologize. Uh, it should have been circulated prior. We just literally finished it a, a few minutes ago. So if we get at least circulated for the benefit of uh, members to read it. All right. Well, look, if people are not content, we can leave it over. But it, it would be we can otherwise deal with the matter and just have it off the agenda. Okay, well, and if I hear no questions of staff, if I hear no speakers other than you saying this is the way to take this off and move it forward, uh, then I'll call the question on it. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. So that item was then dealt with. The motion is passed. Uh, the deputants are, have removed themselves, and I thank them for that. And I apologize to anybody else who wasn't aware this was going on and have been sitting here just waiting to hear that item discussed. Um, all right, so, uh, Mr. Rosenberg, yes, I, since uh, just as a dispensation, uh, you, you, we can take the three minutes with, and will the committee agree to sit till 1231 to hear Mr. Rosenberg, so because he's been waiting patiently. All those in favor, carried. So this is on item 12.2, uh, the digital infrastructure, and you have your three minutes. Okay, so this is about the, uh, the digital infrastructure plan. Um, there are many issues with respect to digital infrastructure, and I think there's just been a little bit too much focus on data as being somehow the most problematic, and I think we need to, to make sure that we're, we're dealing with a proper technology assessment process here, and that we, we take into account automation and the general trends and the problems and need to avoid harms as well as, as look for benefits. So I'm going to make a couple of very specific recommendations. One is in the definition. Um, there's a definition statement where it refers to creation and use of data and information. I want to see the words digital automation added to that because there's a lot more to um, digital technology than just information. It is actually an active force. It's not just holding and, and using information. It's automation. It's, it's, an, it's a, a, a very active phenomenon that has to be treated that way. So I'd like to see that sentence say the creation, uh, exchange, and use of data, information, and digital automation. So we include the use of digital automation in the definition of digital infrastructure. I think that's a fairly obvious point that that is digital infrastructure. In the, in the uh, principles statements, the, the third principle, I would like to see that uh, refer to avoidance of harms as well as benefits. It just reads very strangely now. It says there will be benefits. Um, I mean, there was some discussion about the use of the term will versus must. I think it should say must because it's not a given that it will. It's something we want to make sure what will happen. So I think it should actually say must. But more important than that, it should say avoidance of harms. And harms are not the same thing as risks. Risks are low probability events. Harms are high probability, predictable negative consequences. And I think we have to recognize the technology has a lot of negative negative consequences to the economy, uses a lot of resources, and is reducing productivity. So we have to actually say um, in that sentence, social, and environmental, and economic benefits and avoidance of harms. So in the title of that principle, add benefits and avoidance of harms. And in the sentence that follows it, where it says benefits, add and avoidance of harms. So those are my basically two specific points is digital automation in the de definition and benefits and avoidance of harms in the principle. Um, and I think that, that we really have to have a, a, a 
technology assessment process where we look at impacts and we don't just assume that this is beneficial. A lot of it is actually reducing our standard of living, reducing our welfare and, and bringing in a lot of uncontrollable technology. So we should definitely talk about this as an impact assessment process and use the term avoidance of harms. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg, and thank you for your patience and uh, for your engagement. And uh, we will recess until 1.30. Thank you.